ancestors who began the march of humankind in the womb of Mother Africa. We ask these ancestors to be with us, to strengthen us, and give us a vision for the future. In the name of the African ancestors who began the march of humankind in the womb of Mother Africa and marched down the Nile, laying the foundations for human civilization and culture, we ask these Africans to be with us, to strengthen us, and give us a vision for the future. In the name of these African ancestors who built their pyramids and their temples to their God concepts, to their principles, and to their moral values, who left us a legacy of architectural and monumental building unparalleled in the history of the world, we ask these ancestors who built the pyramids, who built the temples, to be with us, to strengthen us, and give us a vision for the future. We ask these African ancestors who took this African culture and extended it throughout Africa, building the stone cities of Zimbabwe, building the empires of the Sudan, Ghana, Mali, and Sangai, building the Swahili city-states along the east coast of Africa, and in Christian Africa, asking King Lalibela and giving him the courage to build the 12 churches of Lalibela from the ground down, monuments to the world. We ask these Africans who spread this culture to the Dogo and to the Akan and to the Yoruba and to the Bankongo and to the Zulu. We ask these Africans to be with us, to strengthen us and give us a vision for the future. In the name of the Africans who opened up Africa, opened up the Nile Valley to other cultures and other peoples and they came in and nurtured themselves on the African greatness. First coming in early with the ancient Hebrews and they synthesized this culture and produced Judaism. Later coming in with the Christians and they synthesized this culture and produced Christianity. Coming in were also the Greeks who took the African culture, synthesized it and produced Greek civilization. And then later the Prophet Muhammad and with the Arabs coming into the Nile Valley, they synthesized the culture and produced Islam. We ask these African ancestors who as part of their legacy laid the foundations for Judaism, Christianity, Islam and Greek civilization to be with us, to strengthen us and give us a vision for the future. We ask those African ancestors pulled out of Africa, taken to the hells of North America, South America, the Caribbean, maintaining the spirit of African humanity in their hearts and in their minds, and who left us this enormous legacy of struggle. We ask those Africans who resisted enslavement in the villages of Africa, who resisted enslavement in the shores of Africa, who resisted enslavement in those forts and dungeons, who resisted enslavement in the holes of those ships, who resisted enslavement when they arrived on these shores in the New World. We ask these Africans who ran into the highlands of Northeast Brazil and established for 100 years the first free republic in the Americas, the Republic of Palmares, and their last great leader, Zumbi, who speared and sacrificed we ask these Africans who replicated the Brazilian experience and went into the highlands of Jamaica and became the maroon free communities. We ask these Africans who went into the backwoods of the Guyanas and Suriname and created free republic of the Suramaca and the Ajuka. We ask these Africans who went into the backwoods of Georgia and the swamps of Florida and moved with the Seminole Indians and resisted oppression. We ask these Africans who left us a legacy of struggle and resistance, the likes of which no one in the world has, to be with us, to strengthen us, and give us a vision for the future. We ask these Africans who created and laid for us a foundation of struggle and resistance that was passed on generation after generation, that was passed on to Harriet Tubman, who fought away out of enslavement and became a symbol of freedom for all of us. Similarly, Frederick Douglass and hundreds of thousands of others fought their way out of enslavement, we ask those Africans who went with Bookman Dessalines to create the greatest revolutionary experience in the history of the world, the Haitian Revolution, leaving us a legacy, the likes of which no one else has had. We ask these Africans to be with us, to strengthen us, and give us a vision for the future. Uh, follows. <laughs> So the vision, and it's not impossible, as we said before, 
The process is ongoing. Progress sometimes appears slow, but believe me, we know that it's happening on many different fronts across many different uh, parts of, the, of continental Africa and also the African diaspora. African-centeredness ultimately leads to black unity. An understanding of ourselves, of who we are, being able to answer that question. It's a challenge that we pose every Sunday, I think, in this space, that we answer the question of who are we? Who are you? And I think we need to answer that question in terms of finding our own African-centeredness. In terms of coming into the full realization and recognition of our African selves, our African identity. So the mission is to redefine the agendas that will take us to that place of reunification, of African-centeredness, of black power and black unity. Can't get there without a redefinition of the agendas. Got to set our own agendas for change. At the same time, the mission is to provide practical solutions across a full range of Pan-African global and human rights issues, all part and parcel of the redefinition of the agendas. We're bearing witness, we're demanding change, and we are part of a change. What does it mean to bear witness? doesn't mean to just look and see. <laughs> a lot of people think that when you witness something, you just, uh, you just see it. It's a little bit more than that, you know. All right, so what have you done? All right, let's stop confusing ourselves with the music. <laughs> All right, so what does it mean to be a witness? Another question that we need to ask ourselves, challenge ourselves with each week. We bear witness on behalf of those upon whose shoulders we stand. We bear witness on behalf of our ancestors. We bear witness on behalf of our families. We bear witness on behalf of our communities, on behalf of Africa, on behalf of our African selves. And if we understand this within the context that we're bearing witness on behalf of, then bearing witness suddenly means a whole different thing. So that bearing witness on behalf of our ancestors, meaning also that we protect and preserve and build up on that which our ancestors have achieved to this point. So in this space, for myself, I reaffirm, I bear witness on behalf of Chief Taichi. We know him as Taki. I bear witness on behalf of Sam Sharp, Baba Sam Sharp, understanding that bearing witness is to ensure that the promise, the full promise of emancipation is realized, that the wars and the battles fought for this promise, for emancipation, are realized and not in vain. So bearing witness on behalf of Chief Taichi, bearing witness on behalf of Taki, Chief Taki, bearing witness on behalf of a Sam Sharp to me becomes not just to read the history of what happened, but to be part of the ongoing process that leads to full emancipation, full freedom, full free. So we bear witness on behalf of Ya Asan Tua. Understanding, as Dr. John Henry Clark says, that to hold a person in oppression, you have to convince them first that they are supposed to be oppressed. And you know, that's a potent statement because if we continue to talk about the state of oppression that we find ourselves in, 
without doing anything about it, without accepting it, with, with, by accepting it, then it seems to me as if we are convinced that somehow we are supposed to be in this state of oppression. And who dare, <laughs> who dare to tell us or to suggest to us that that is our reality. So we bear witness on behalf of our ancestors. We bear witness on behalf of Hatshepsut, who understood her role in the building of great civilizations. So we're bearing witness and we're demanding change and we're being part of that change. It is the Africa Forum and this is what the space, <laughs> this is what the space is about. It's a rebellious state because we rebel against oppression. We're rebelling against injustice. We're rebelling against inequity. We're rebelling against oppression. We're rebelling against Eurocentric ideals, ideology. We're rebelling against neocolonialism. So we told you all that we were doing before, what we stood for in terms of the reunification of the African family for development. And then now we're telling you what we stand against and what the space becomes as a result of that. Rebellious communication is a tool that we use in this spot, this physical space. Radical media, we understand it to mean exactly what it means. We we'll spend some time talking about radical media uh, throughout the, the coming months. I think it's important for us to do so because I think that there is a misunderstanding of what radical media means from the feedback <laughs> so we're going to spend some time talking about the term radical media and what rebellious communication is so we'll do that at a later date you know we're going to be talking uh, and be saying this we're going to be repeating this a few times throughout this program this morning uh, from Dr. John Henry Clark to hold a person in oppression you have to convince them first that they are supposed to be oppressed. So this is what we're going to be doing this morning. We're kicking off a series and we have been on these, but uh, we're going to be focusing our, our attention in the next uh, few coming months. And every once in a while, you will uh, hear us return to these conversations because in the next few months, we're going to be spending some time uh, looking at these issues. Uh, you might, uh, well, we have, we've all been part of the con conversation, the discussion, the ongoing discussion regarding Goat Islands, without, uh, regarding the plans for coal energy, to use coal energy on Goat Island. And I think much more than that, China in Jamaica. So we're looking at the broader picture because I think that every time we become reductionists, that we tend to lose the bigger picture so that, yeah, there are issues and there are, uh, you know, different elements of China in Jamaica, the issue of China in Jamaica, that becomes flare-up points, um, points of eruption. And uh, then we spend all of our energies talking about that one needlepoint thing, that one thing. Uh, when there is so much more 
in terms of how broadly we should be viewing China and Africa. From my own perspective, and this is how we look at it within this space, uh, as part of radical media, is that we make that comparison between China in Africa and China in Jamaica. Because we feel that understanding the only other place where we see China expanding in recent times to the extent uh, comparable enough to what we see about to, is about to happen in the Caribbean is Africa. As a matter of fact, I do not believe that you know, we'll see the kind of expansion within the Caribbean that we're seeing in Africa. So there's a whole lot to learn from what's going on in Africa. And one of the questions we've been asking is how can we leverage, how can we leverage China-Africa relations? How can we leverage China-Jamaica relations? So we're going to be focusing on some of that this morning. But uh, also there is a conversation on coal energy and, and, and the discussion about whether or not um, China is going to be allowed to use coal energy on Goat Island. Uh, for me, that takes me now right back to China in China. Because where we already have the answers, we shouldn't really have too many questions. <laughs> the question before it is asked has been answered. China in China regarding coal energy is where we are to look for the answers regarding whether or not we should allow or entertain any conversation regarding the China's use of coal energy in Jamaica. So uh, we're going to be taking a, a, a short uh, discussion program from China TV, China Television, as it broadcasts mainly uh, across the continent of Africa, but also back to China and the rest of the world via cable. Uh, and an interview on the program Global Insights, because they do have a program called Global Insights. And on that program, there was a, a recent conversation, well, two, two different conversations regarding pollution in China, China's smog problem, uh, and so we want to carry those two uh, shortish discussion programs on China's smog problem and then come back to talk a little bit about it to also get your views. Hopefully, we'll be able to get your views on this. So we want to uh, play those two programs, uh, open the phone line, get your views on this, and then to return to the other, uh, the other issues that we have to deal with this morning. So the interview uh, about how eastern and northern China uh, is now mired in smog. In one of the programs, in one of the features, you'll hear that in Beijing, the air was so bad that residents were uh, urged to stay indoors for their own good. There is a, a piece of uh, research, there's some research that have been done regarding health issues and China's smog problem and how this um, goes back to coal. And that is entitled Dying for Development. And it's one of those uh, pieces of paper that we're going to be reading. And <laughs> pieces of paper. Well, it's, one of that, it's one of the documents that we'll be reading, um, hopefully interviewing the author uh, and authors of this document to get a better perspective on how you know, they see China's, China and Chinese on mainland China dying, literally dying for development. And it is something to bear in mind even here uh, in Jamaica. Are we prepared to die for development? So we have that coming up. And we have what we want to introduce this morning because we want to go in depth uh, throughout the coming months looking at the Caribbean Basin Initiative. So we don't have a whole lot this morning, but I want to go to St. Kitts Nevis where uh, one of the sessions uh, took place at the Caribbean Basin Security Initiative and just to play one of the speeches or two uh, from, from St. Kitts Nevis uh, so you get an idea. And, and, in, and in particular, we want to pay some attention to the 
reference and the continued reference to constant reference to that part of a Caribbean based security initiative which points to narcotics and the trade in narcotics. This is relevant to us and to the conversation, the discussions on the decriminalization of ganja. One of the reasons why we are already hearing that the U.S. is not too pleased with this is that the 240-odd million U.S. dollars that has been pumped into the Caribbean Basin Initiative to militarize the Caribbean waters, that it has a three-pronged approach. It stands on three feet, and one one of that is one foot is to... Is, is about narcotics, is about drugs, is about the drug trade. And remember, ganja um, at the time and still is described as a drug in these, um, in these documents. So that the pillar, one of the strongest pillars of the Caribbean Basin Initiative is to prevent the trade uh, of, of drug, uh, including ganja, within the Caribbean Basin, within the Caribbean waters. So uh, we want to start the conversation there. And then later on, we want to go back now and spend some time looking at what is involved in the Caribbean Basin Initiative. We're using whatever information we have at our fingertips because uh, getting to the bottom line of what uh, the, 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 the different aspects, the elements are in terms of what's been signed off on and then the MOUs and so are secret and otherwise, you know, very, very difficult. But I'm sure we'll get there sooner or later. So in the meantime, though, we're starting that conversation. So we have that coming up inside of the program this morning. Isis Miller will be joining me on the phone lines. Denise, Denise, (laughs) Denise. Isis Miller. I love Denise because, you know, you're called Denise on my paper. And I'm <laughs> All right, so Denise Isis Miller. Uh, to talk quickly about woman vision. And we also want to go to Pinnacle. We have been trying to make contact with Pinnacle to find out what is the latest. There was a meeting that was scheduled for last Tuesday. We want an update on that. So we've been trying to get to... Donisha Prendergast or someone who was at the meeting to talk to us about that. We want a quick update on that. Remember, to hold a person in oppression, you have to convince them first that they are supposed to be oppressed. In the bottom line this morning, we want to talk quickly about when and where we enter. And, uh, you know, there's so many different angles from which you take this. We're going to go within the strictest angle, which is um, from Anna Julia Cooper in 1886. When and where we enter, she argues that only the black woman can say when and where I enter. This morning, right after International Women's Day, uh, we want to talk a little bit about that in the bottom line. Very, very short bottom line this morning. Uh, But we want to talk quickly about what it means, what it means for us as black women when we say... Only the black woman can say when and where I enter. So we've got lots and lots to come inside of the program this morning at 6.32. Going to play some music, then we take a quick break. We'll be right back. Speak truth to the people. To identify the enemy is to free the mind. Free the mind of the people. Speak to the mind of the people. Speak truth. Hide nothing from the masses of the people. Tell no lies. Expose lies whenever they are told. Mass no difficulties. Mistakes, failures. Claim no easy victory. When we lose our African connection, we lose our royal connection. When we disconnect ourselves from Africa, we cease to be a world people. Without the African connection, we are a disjointed people begging for the entry into somebody else's house. Free 
man must be free, he will be free. Oh, I just want to, it's Burning Spear, and we felt like a Burning Spear, and this is the one we could find. <laughs> so free Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela, in this case, you know, signifies um, our situation and signifies the continent of Africa. So just think that within your mind, and don't start talking about what you're not dead. No, 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 no. Nelson Mandela now is bigger than just the man Nelson Mandela, okay? So here we go. So we're watching what's happening in South Africa. Malema Spachi, he, he has fashioned a, a radical message of empowerment, a message that has struck at the heart of South Africa's twin evils of inequality and racism. And that is what makes the EFF a party to reckon with. So that he was also not fired by the ANC. He... Uh, he defected. Uh, the ANC kicked him out when he could not stop, stomach his socialist message. And uh, let's see. There, it's May, May 7. This is one to watch in South Africa. The ANC is a force to reckon with. And I do not think that this is a year. I do not think that this is a year that the ANC... Uh, would crumble. But lots to see. And there are other elections. Malawi, we understand, are to hold its elections on May 20. Africa's only second woman head of state is up for election. And this is interesting. Joyce Banda. She's up for elections. Remember, she was in the opposition party when the president died. She was marginalized as a vice president. And uh, she's supported, of course, by Ellen Johnson Sirleaf of Liberia. She's been to Malawi to give her support uh, to Joyce Banda. So that's coming up in uh, on May 20, did we say? Yeah. There are elections coming up in Botswana, in Mozambique, and Namibia. Uh, they're holding elections this year. Also, March 16, Guinea-Bissau, Guinea-Bissau um, elections scheduled for, this is what, March 9 for March 16? Oh, we're going to have to double check that. Yeah, but it, it was scheduled for March 16. But Guinea-Bissau, as we all know, you know, it's interesting, <laughs> has been identified as a narco state. <laughs> and... Uh, Lots happening there. It has been branded as a narco state by the by the United States, but it's holding elections on March 16. <laughs> Term used to describe it is complicated. <laughs> All right. Uh, lots of coups in Guinea-Bissau. No elected personnel. No elected person. And correct me if I'm wrong. Has ever completed a term no elected administration because the military um, always, always interrupts that so it was given March 16 as a day to hold elections the previous date of November as you recall was postponed also the Central African Republic also uh, you know, looking forward to holding elections. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen there. There was an interim president, Catherine Samba Panza. They say she has the most unenviable job in the continent of Africa, but let's see what she does um, as she struggles to stabilize the Central African Republic. Uh, the countries in the north are also um, talking about elections. Algeria, the so-called Arab Spring affected Algeria. But uh, we'll see. Libya, <laughs> there is no Libya anymore. We can fight. We can stop saying Libya now. That entire country is splintered among many, many tribal lines because. Uh, the the um the system of government that was in place in Libya uh, managed to held these different 
tribal areas are together. See, there's, there's a lack of understanding among Western leaders, and especially the U.S. and, and the European Union, about how many African countries, uh, what their politics uh, is. And, and this is where we see the kind of uh, ridiculousness that came out of um, George Bush's mouth when he talked about Iraq and how the people of Iraq would have welcomed the United States. That, um, and, and I know Iraq is not in Africa, but this is just a, an example uh, to help us to better understand. So that there's, there's such a lack of understanding that it boggles the mind that they do not have consultants and advisors who know a bit more about the politics of these nations. Well, Libya's interim parliament had said February 20 as a date for national election. Well, you know how that went. Tunisia is uh, scheduled to hold elections in October. Let us watch to see what's happening in Mauritania. And uh, so that's how the continent of Africa is looking. As far as elections for 2014 are concerned, we're going to be watching all of them. Our, our attention right now is on South Africa. ATL Automotive Limited, your authorized distributors for Honda, Volkswagen, Audi, Jaguar, and Land Rover, is open on Saturdays from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. The time by ATL Automotive is... Now, a minute after seven. You're inside of the Africa Forum, Running African. All right, so as we've been telling you, we're, we're concerned too and watching what's happening in terms of uh, uh, Sino Jamaican relationships at China in Jamaica. And one of the things that I have done personally is to begin a scholarship, and that is, and, and, and that is no joke. I'm doing this as if I was going to do a, a master's degree, and I'm treating it in the very same way. Uh, to begin a scholarship of looking at uh, China in Africa. And to say, uh, how then, uh, what are the mistakes uh, made in Africa? Questions, raise questions about leveraging as far as uh, the success stories are concerned on the continent of of Africa in terms of China-Jamaica relations, because there are those. And also the failures. And to say, how can we uh, learn from the successes, from the failures, how do we avoid making the very same mistakes here on the ground? And, and why, uh, why do we seem powerless? Because it appears so to me, whether we're on the continent of Africa for the most part, or here uh, in the Caribbean, in, in Jamaica in particular, to leverage this relationship between China and Jamaica. What, what is causing this level of powerless? Yes, 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 we can talk about poverty and so on and so on. But... <laughs> You know, China wants to be here. China wants to be in the Caribbean. China wants to be in Jamaica. That is enough for our leaders to push the boundaries a bit to ensure that they do not sell out and sell again the people of Jamaica. And that is why there is so much anger, you know, and so much emotion because the people of Jamaica do not feel as if they are part of these negotiations, part of the conversations, or, or as if in any way we are considered uh, when, when the government is signing away uh, our rights to, to China. And that is how people feel. And that's why you have the kind of rhetoric, the kind of narrative that you are having. Uh, and so for my own self, I've been looking at some of these issues, uh, very same issues uh, that the continent of Africa fa- um, faced and how they've been dealing with them, the regrets, because they are talking about the regrets. But I'm also looking at China in China to say, well, uh, take energy, for example. How does China um, treat with, ch- energy, with um, uh, clean energy, alternative energy and so on in China? And then... Uh, what can we expect if they export the very same kind of of behavior <laughs> in terms of their attitudes to, to energy uh, to, to Jamaica? What can we expect? So one of the things that we've been doing, and I've been doing this, is to 
follow um, China Television, China Journalism, China Literature, and to read from all different angles. That's coming from the U.S., it's coming from Europe, it's coming from China, it's coming from a continent of Africa. And then to see where in all of that we can make sense of our own particular situation. So Global Insights is a program on China Television, and they carried uh, two programs recently on China and the smog problem, searching for a solution in China. I want to carry, I want to rebroadcast these two programs this morning. They're about 15 minutes each, so it's going to be about half an hour. And then after that, hopefully we'll get some time to, to get your comments on what you have heard. So we're going to take them back to back uh, from, from a CCC, CC, uh, TV. All right, so let's go to the first one. I think this one is um, searching for, for solutions to China's smog problem. Well, anyway, there are two, so let's go to the first one. This past week, eastern and northern China had an unwelcome visitor, more smog. In Beijing, the air is so bad the residents were urged to stay indoors for the good of their health. Although the hazardous haze was ultimately blown away by some strong winds, the search continues for a lasting solution to pollution problems. Our reporter Tom Wu finds out how city residents have been dealing with the smog. Choking on smog yet again. Just when people in the capital thought it was over, another toxic cloud descended on the city. Things got so bad that the municipal government advised all 20 million residents to avoid all physical activity outdoors. It's a, uh, it's a little, a little bit worse than uh, than some other places that I've been. But we try to stay inside as much as we can when it's uh, when it gets really bad, you know. A few days ago, I saw many children were seeing doctors for respiratory disease. He even posted an online opinion poll to rally support for his proposal. More than 46,000 people voted, with almost 99% backing the idea. If the government follows up on his suggestion, the new law would impose car-free days during heavy smog, higher standards for vehicle fuel, and stricter standards on industrial and exhaust gas emissions. But what lies behind Penn's proposal is a concern that current legislation isn't doing enough to protect the environment. The problem has become all the more urgent as the hazardous haze has gone nationwide. A total of 1.3 million square kilometers across China were engulfed in smog this week. That's one-seventh of the whole country. And the main source? Coal-powered heating plants and the exhaust gas from millions of vehicles. As Beijing chokes on its fourth round of heavy smog this month, the pollution rates have once again gone off the charts. According to the U.S. Embassy, the ratings are now 25 times higher than World Health Organization standards. This is really having an effect on people's lives. The city is now seeing a major spike in respiratory illness, and that's even made the streets more dangerous. 54-year-old Shi Haichuan has been working as a public transport guide at bus stops for more than a year. It's his job to keep order at bus stops during the weekday rush hours. While things have cleaned up a little when we spoke to him on Friday, the smoggy week has taken its toll. I am very happy that a sunny day was clean air is back. My throat hurt and I coughed a lot yesterday when there was smog. The polluted air made me feel really uncomfortable. The streets are not safe to stay because of the pollution. On Wednesday, the Beijing municipal government took action, ordering one-third of government vehicles off the streets and closure of more than 100 factories. And more and more citizens are realizing that they might be able to play a role in improving the environment. We should take buses or some other public transport to help alleviate the air pollution. We've lived in Beijing for more than 20 years. We had smog in the past, but not so frequently and not so bad. I think it's caused by car exhausts. So we've chosen not to drive unless we have to. China's rapid development over the past three decades has come with a price. For many, the resulting environmental damage is reaching intolerable levels. But analysts say that even if serious measures are taken now, it'll still take years to clean up the air in Beijing.
This is the first sunny day in Beijing in almost a month. It looks like we have the wind to thank for blowing the pollution away. People in the city have been talking about the nice weather all day, almost like it's a rare treat. But the sunshine can't last forever, and the wind is an unreliable solution at best. For World Insight, I'm Tang Bo in Beijing. For more on Beijing's pollution problems, we are joined from Oslo by Samantha Smith, leader of the Worldwide Fund for Nature's Global Climate and Energy Initiative. And here in Beijing, we have Professor Qi Ye from the School of Public Policy and Management at Tsinghua University. Welcome to the both of you. Professor Qi, now we see the wind blew away the heavy smog which has bothered in Beijing for the past two weeks. Do you think people's memory can be very short and therefore Forget about the smog and move on. Well, the smog is gone for two short days. The, the smog was gone with wind for the uh, very sh two short days and uh, actually came back today. And now we get a level of 200 or so. The, uh, even like if we here. want to forget, yeah. we will be, unfortunately, we will be keep, re keep reminded. And this thing is not gone. The, the, it will keep coming back. Mm. We see other cities in history, London, for example, or some of the major industrial cities in the United States. It took them about 50, 40 to 50 years to clear up the sky once the fog, smog um, fell into the city. But can China, Ms. Smith, afford that speed? If not, Ms. Smith, what can China do now to immediately have an impa impact on the smog? I think China cannot afford to take as long as some of the industrialized cities in the West took to clean up their air and the surrounding environment. And that's, that's just because of the rate of growth in China and also the urgency of this for Chinese citizens. But it's also a, probably not necessary for China to take as long as these other cities have taken to clean up historically. Some things that China can do now, it is already doing. For example, some of the measures that the government of the city of Beijing have taken actually are removing some of the immediate sources of pollution. And people in China are also taking some of these measures. They're choosing not to drive and to use public transportation instead. But longer term action is needed and it will take a while to, uh, for the effects of that action to be felt. For example, China could revise its current law on air pollution and air quality. It could also improve uh, vehicle emission standards. And it could continue to do what it's done, which is to focus on rapidly increasing the share of renewable energy in the power sector. Right. There are several power points we can do as to what China can do, what Beijing can do right now. But Mr. Qi, here's the thing. In the industrialized cities in the West, they were having the industrialization which smog fell onto the cities. But here in China, we got two huge movements going on all at the same time. Industrialization and urbanization, all at the same time. Do you think any of those proposals put forward by Mrs. Smith earlier will be able to really solve the problem in such a massive scale as we've witnessed over the past two weeks? I think that the, the, the particular challenge we face, very rapid and massive urbanization together with a very rapid and massive industrialization right now. And, and also, the, because the China has become such a huge manufacturing hub, not only for China, but for the entire world, we face particular challenges. But I, I do agree with, uh, with Matha uh, on the point, you know, short term measures very much needed for now. And we do also need to, to consider long-term the uh, measures. Right now, it is such a great opportunity. It's a window opportunity for making some you know, more proactive policies, more tough measures you know, on the pollution. And this is the time for seriously change the economic development model. Right. Well, there have been a lot of talk, Professor Chi. You know this more than I do about what should be the priority for China's development. Should it be more about guarantee the quality of life for the people, or should it be more about guarantee the economic growth rate, which in turn would also guarantee employment opportunities and also 
compelling of cash in the Chinese banks so that the people can be served in the future. There are different priorities. Also, there is the question about when to put forward the restructuring of the economic structure. When to put forward that plan? Is this the best time to put forward that plan? Definitely. When do you see these two, how do you see these two points? Well, uh, actually, I think you, you answer your own questions <laughs> the, uh, right now. I because, hope not. <laughs> right, because uh, the, right now, we definitely have to put the quality of life. After all, what is all this development for, right? The, the development, the, the economic growth is for improving the quality, the standard of life. The, uh, the r right now, we need to reconsider these, uh, how much we are willing to sacrifice the rate of growth for the for the economy, mm. and in, in order to reduce the, the you know the, 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 the material bath will have already affected us. When people are coughing, when people are f f feeding the, the the symptoms every day, and there is a no, there is no point for economic development. And also, we have, to, we have to keep in mind that the argument for a greater economic growth, mm -hmm. you know, often thinking about the social problems, employment and, and other, th other things, I think they, that can be addressed, you know, by improving, you know, the, the, the distribution of wealth and distribution, right. you know, over the entire society or over the, 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 the better coverage for that. But this is the time to reconsider the strategy to put the, the put really the quality of life. All right. First. However, things are more complicated than we can explain in the studio, Ms. Smith. Therefore, I want to invite your wisdom here. On the one hand, you do have all of these priorities and plans needs to be put forward. On the other hand, what all of these plans are for the satisfaction of the general public for social progress. On the other hand, the society. Every individual also is aspiring to drive a car. They want to have this modern comfort. And they argue the transportation public ones are not good enough for them to forget about the cars. So you got, on the one hand, people are asking for solutions. On the other hand, people are reluctant to act on solutions. This is very interesting gridlock here, Ms. Smith. Hmm. Well, this is a problem we see globally. Mm. Uh, so, so on a global basis, people are very concerned about pollution. They're very concerned about climate change, and they're feeling the effects of climate change in their daily lives. Also in the United States, for example, which was hit by a series of extreme weather events in 2012. But still, for people to get out of their cars and to do their part on solutions, it's very difficult. I think there are two sides to this. So one side, of course, is that for governments to plan ahead and to have good infrastructure, good public transportation, so that it really is easy and convenient and practical and affordable for people to use public transportation. And then on the other hand, I think that we all have a responsibility to contribute. There's one other part of this, though, which is maybe a false, a false problem. And that's the idea that in order to have continued high growth in China or anywhere else, that you have to continue to have high pollution. And that's not necessarily the case. I mean, China's already showing with the current five-year plan that Chinese companies can reduce their emissions, can become more energy efficient, less energy intensive, mm. and also that China can roll out renewable energy at scale. Right. Well, we Many all... other countries are going to have to walk this same path. And China can take the lead, not only in renewable energy, all right. but also, for example, in building buildings that use a lot less energy and in building clean infrastructure. Well, those are certainly very important suggestions, but before we go, I want to have a very practical question for you, Professor Chi, before we go. That is, the Chinese enterprises, they have to suck up the cost of reducing the pollution. And we know right now it's very difficult economically in a very difficult economic time. Can those demands be put forward to them? And would they be able to implement it at this moment? Well, I think the, uh, we have to think about the cost, but th this is not just a cost issue. This is the issue of internalize mm. the, the environmental ban they have already made. That's so right. the polluter is a pays principle. This is very, very clear. Mm. And I do, the, uh, I do appreciate the difficulty they face right now, particularly for small and medium-sized uh, enterprises. But look, the large-sized enterprises the, the large polluters 
This is the time to ask them to pay their fair share. Mm. The government, the private sector, and the civil society, they all have to play their own roles to make Absolutely. things better. Right. Professor Chi Ye and Samantha Smith, thank you so much for coming over to discuss this issue. Thank you. Thank you. And that from CCTV, we're going to go back to the next um, discussion in a little while. But that's a point. The government, the private sector, and civil society. When you hear civil society, of course, we're talking about me and you. Uh, how do we play our part in ensuring that we do not even begin to go in the direction that we hear China is struggling with right now? That's the direction of pollution. That's the direction of um, ill health and and you heard i mean if you have people with respiratory problems coughing and you know choking and and breathing problems you you would want to deal with this first before you talk about the other issues because the question uh that china that has been raised in china is whether to 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 pollute first and then once um you know the industrialization that comes as a result of uh, well, with the pollution once you've made it economically then you clean up later this is a policy that china has held on to for a great while now and that policy is a failed policy that policy of polluting first and cleaning up later it is the same policy that china is about to introduce to jamaica let's this requires some plain speaking and for the sake of africa let us speak plainly. This All right, Sergeant Dr. Kwame Nkuma there. This requires some plain speaking. And for the sake of Africa, let us speak plainly. Uh, we want to go to the second uh, discussion. Now, these are conversations that are happening in China about China's pollution problems, searching for solutions to pollution. That's what they're talking about in China. And they're attributing the pollution in China to energy derived from coal. And we are having a conversation in Jamaica not about uh, alternative sources of energy, solar energy in this sunny, 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 sunny city, um, island. We're talking about, you know, allowing China to come in with this very same problem that they have found themselves in on their own mainland. So let's go back to the conversation and see what else we can learn. Watching World Inside on CCTV News. We're broadcasting our program here in Beijing. You only need to look out of the window here in Beijing to see that smog is still a very serious problem. This past week saw the hazardous haze return to northern China, prompting renewed debates here on what needs to be done to solve the pollution problem. Before we go to our panel today, let's take a look back at what's been a gray sky week. In our program here in Beijing, you only need to look out of the window here in Beijing to see that smog is still a very serious problem. This past week saw the hazardous haze return to northern China, prompting renewed debates here on what needs to be done to solve the pollution problem. Before we go to our panel today, let's take a look back at what's been a gray sky week for Beijing. Hazy days in China as the now infamous smog returned. Gray sky spread far and wide in the north and central areas, especially feeling the effect. Hospitals also saw a surge of patients suffering from the effects of the smog. We normally only have one doctor on duty per station, but this weekend we had to put two doctors on. Masks have become a must for literally everyone, and the smog spares no one, not even the president of the country. Some even filed a lawsuit against the Hebei provincial government, blaming them for the pollution and asking for compensation. But blaming government in action may not be entirely fair. In big cities like Beijing, air quality is measured every day. Car use is limited and factories have been moved out of town. But the impact is hard to measure and the air people breathe still seems far from pure. The search for solutions has sparkled some novel ideas. Some say pumping liquid nitrogen into the air can bring down the hazardous particles in the air as it crystallizes. 
Others suggested Beijing building houses, offices and shopping malls inside huge bubbles or installing vacuum cleaners on top of skyscrapers. But bad air may just be the price of progress in a developing country. Back in 1952, a four-day smog led to 4,000 premature deaths in London. Ever since, the city has fought a continuous battle to keep pollution at bay. Many believe that China cannot possibly win the battle overnight. In the end, it was a strong wind that brought back the blue skies. It's a breath of fresh air for Beijingers, and masks can now be left at home. Of course, the wind is far from a perfect solution, but for the time being, it may be all we have as the struggle against smog continues. Wang Xinyi, CCTV, Beijing. To talk more on China's smog problem, joining us in London is Professor Anna Laura Wing White from Oxford University. She's an associate professor specializing in human geography of China. She's written several books and articles on China's environmental problems, including a very scaring title, Dying for Development, Pollution, Illness, and the Limits of Citizens' Agency in China. In Washington, D.C., we have Dr. Jennifer Turner, director of the China Thank Environment you. Forum at the Woodrow Wilson Center. And here in Beijing, we have Dr. Wang Tao from the Carnegie Tsinghua Center for global policy. Welcome to our program. Uh, Dr. Wang, you were in Beijing during the smog week. Yes. Yes, I am. As an energy expert, how did you react to that kind of weather? Days of hazy smog in the sky. Well, I think there's not much difference between experts and ordinary people in mm -hmm. days like that. The only thing you can do is just put on a mask and reduce the outdoor activities as much as you can. And uh, basically just trying to stay away from the streets. We understand, Dr. Wang, there have been a number of regulations, shall we say, contingency plans being issued by the Beijing municipal government as well as some of the other places in China to fight against smog. But will these contingency plans really solve the problem or it is only providing some comfort at a time of crisis? I think you're absolutely right. I mean, we have had the quite advanced environment law for many years, but yet that didn't help us uh, really prevent from having the very severe smogs in Beijing and also across China. And I think that is because the law has been made but not implemented very well. And the deep root of this problem, I think, is because of the uh, top priorities of local governments has is and has been the pursuit of GDP. And they always have choose to sacrifice environment over the development. And I think that is something we have to address. Um, we sometimes uh, have the local ED EPA, the Environment Protection, Protection Agencies, uh, usually are understaffed. Uh, maybe they are weaker uh, in terms of the decision makings. They may not be able to stand up and against the decision made by the economic department because of the pursuit of, of mm -hmm. the GDP. But also sometimes, and even worse cases, um, the local officials could be corrupted and they are actually helping and pro pro protect the uh, polluters from being punished or even being, being found. Right. So I think that is even worse situations we have. There are and quite a number of issues there, really. Exactly. But Dr. Turner, do you think this is merely a development stage issue? No, well, yes and no. I mean, <clears throat> you have to keep in mind that China's economic development is really off the Richter scale in terms of its speed, and that, that China is also unique and that, I mean, it's heavily, heavily dependent on coal. I think that, you know, Wang Tao's comments about the governance issues are, are a big driver of the problem, but ultimately a lot of the air pollution problems stem from the, the problems in the power sector, the dependence on coal, even though over the past seven years China has had the big clean green energy revolution, renewables, wind power, cleaner coal, but your electricity use is growing so quickly that coal is still king and it's an incredibly dirty king. Mm -hmm. And therefore, Dr. Turner, is there any solution in the near term? Because people have been talking about solving the problem in 30 years, 50 years, citing example, let's just say, from the city of London or even San Francisco. But people here cannot stand that long a waiting period of time. Are solutions in sight? Is the energy structure easily changed or actually we really have to wait for decades? I don't think you necessarily have to wait for decades. What Wang Tao mentioned in terms of the actual enforcement of some of the pollution control laws, that could do a lot initially. But there needs to be some, you know, China really needs to reboot their whole thinking on energy. It's all been about supply, supply, supply. Mm -hmm. You need to really 
half the battle is going to be energy efficiency. Mm -hmm. and so a lot more needs to be done. And so I hate to say it, there's, there's, it's going to be messy in terms of you know governance. It's not just about enforcing what local officials do, but things about pricing and, 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 and transparency. I mean, the cost of coal is huge, and those costs need to be need to be pulled in. I have a lot of faith because when you've really seen what China has done on the renewable energy front, it's phenomenal. Last year, your country installed the most solar PV panels you know, of any country in the world. Right. And I think that kind of, you know, that, you know, the one power, you know, the, the power that the central government can wield can be really helpful, kind of like environmental authoritarianism. But, 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 but there's going to be still, a lot of changes. Uh, but I have to say... Uh, Mr. Wang here in Beijing, it is still alternative energy that we are talking about. There's still new alternatives. They're not likely to replace the role of coal that has been playing in China's energy structure. Electricity and many of the other things have been generated by coal burning. So is there any way to make it much cleaner than what it is in order to change the overall structure, Mr. Wang? Well, I think Jennifer said is absolutely right. We need in the long term to replace coal with renewables, with other clean energies. And also we have to change the way we think about energy. We, we're not just to supply, we also have to make the price in the right, uh, in the right level that make people to think twice before they actually decide to supply the energy. But I think in the short term, that is also, there are some things we can do. They're not just, uh, we, we just wait and until maybe a few decades later. Um, for example, the coal power plants, they are not just necessarily all bad. I mean, if we really implement very advanced technologies and enforce the law, enforce the standards, mm -hmm. they could be much cleaner, at least much cleaner than today, and we will see a lot of alleviation of the smog levels in today. Professor Laura Wainwright, you've been listening to the other two panelists, but can the change be sufficient enough to make the eventual energy restructuring um, as soon as possible so that people here in Beijing and elsewhere in the northern part of China will not have to suffer too much from the smog? I'm not sure I can hear you well. Um, I think you're asking me about citizens? Well, that could also be an interesting question, but I'm asking you, can change be done as quickly as possible? What made a big difference is that we did turn away from coal and we rely on it much less now, so I think that's a lesson for China. Um, there are huge environmental health consequences, of course, as some of the other contributors have mentioned. Um, Reliance on coal produces air pollution, which in turn causes mm -hmm. lung cancer, causes severe respiratory diseases, cardiovascular diseases. Um, it can induce um, lower birth weight, uh, premature birth. So it's, it's really important for the sake of people's health and for the sake of the environment, but also in the longer term for the sake of a sustainable growth uh, that China turns away from. Right. Uh, Professor Laura Winwright, uh, I guess a lot of people already understand from the smog weather outside, already very clear, coal burning is going to be a big problem. Yes. So there is, first of all, recognition of the problem, and secondly, there are some solutions. But the problem facing us is now whether the solutions can be efficiently solving the problems, and whether people we're talking about can wait that long. Professor, you've been doing a lot of research about citizens' roles in terms of its uh, its importance of tackling environment problems. What do you think about the role of Chinese citizens at this moment during the smog days? Uh, are they being mobilized? What is their role versus that of the government? I think the signs are that the Chinese population is increasingly concerned with pollution. This is not only um, in terms of um, suing local governments, as we've seen with Li Guixin recently, uh, but also taking action in a s several other ways, resorting to NGOs, resorting to the media, um, resorting to petitioning, and on some occasions taking direct action and taking to the streets. We've seen that a couple of years ago in Shifang, Qidong, Limbo. So there's certainly a concern. People have also, uh, I think very importantly, started to try to collect their own data uh, to testify that air pollution is a problem. Mm -hmm. This is a phenomenon we might call citizen science, which I think can really help um, the government in implementing um, policies uh, in a much stricter uh, way. 
Mm. But we also must, must remember, I've done much of my research in rural China, and the rural Chinese are also very concerned about pollution. Unfortunately, they don't get as much coverage as they might, so the impression is that they are more passive. But they are, in fact, very concerned. So across the board, I think um, there's some, something needs to be done, and listening to citizens is certainly a good way um, to start. Right. Uh, on that point, let me just reflect a little bit about the, the energy that China is using right now, how much it depends on coal, uh, compared especially to what London was back in the 1950s. When the Great Small broke out in London in the 1950s, 61% of their energy came from burning coal. And now in China, coal took up about 95%. Today, UK has reduced its use of 19.2%. Oil and natural gas already picked up most of the slack, and nuclear taking up another 78 But now, in China, coal takes up nearly still 70% of the total generation of powers. Um, nuclear is only 0.8%. Uh, Dr. Wang, there are debates here in China sure. about so many different kinds of alternative energies. You know, solar... Yeah. Um, hydro, yeah. there's and nuclear rain. as yeah. well. Each has its advantages and, of course, disadvantages as yes. well. It makes it extremely difficult at this time to choose because once decisions are being made, Dr. Wang, you know this better than I do, mass scale of operations are likely to be done. So this is a very delicate decision to be made. Oh, so what do you think about the prospect of energy? the major source of energy, and the future use of coal? I think the answer is quite clear. Um, the National Energy Administration has already made the plan for both this year and also this five-year plan, and also uh, even up to 2020, that we are going to see the share of coal reducing all the way. And that on that, we are going to increase in the share of all the others, all the others actually, uh, in their plan. So that including, for example, wind, solar, uh, even biomass and nuclear, and hydro as well. Um, of course, hydro is already very big, and we cannot increase as much as we can. But I think the general trend for China is very clear that we have to reduce the share of coal and increase in the share probably of the others, especially renewables. We may have another uh, thought about whether we should increase the share of oil mm -hmm. and natural gas in the short term could help us very well, but I think there would be also side effects to take account. So I think that is a fundamental question we need to ask now. It's not which one we should go, it's actually how we're going to create a market force, market mechanism, and also the set up the needed infra infrastructures and policy incentives to make those things happen so we can actually have a much cleaner energy structures mm -hmm. and more close to the world average rather than just uh, like us. I think we are quite unique of a few countries, very much dominated by based on the code. Right. I already feel motivated while you are talking about this, Dr. Wang, but okay. let's just face the reality, Dr. Turner. Do you think things will get worse before getting ever better? <laughs> well, I think that, I mean, the China, you know, it, it could things could be at, at a tipping point. I think that you know you can, you can run, but you can't hide from the fact that the air is really bad right now. Mm -hmm. And I think that that we are seeing a lot of you know these these kind of some of them kind of short term measures are just that. But I think that we're seeing there's a lot of institutions in place to start moving forward. And for example, on becoming more energy efficient, it's going to have to become much more aggressive. And and like a, you know because again, even if you start adding all these different kinds of clean energy. You know, China doubled their, their electricity use between 2000 and 2007 and is doubling it again. So China has, you know, it, it's, it's in this situation where it has to become incredibly efficient. There's a lot of energy that's wasted, and wasted energy means that's more smog. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I think that, you know, it, you're at a, you really are at a turning point in China. Exactly, as a turning point. And people have been, you know, using their own wisdom in order to fight against the crisis fight against the smog. Let's take a look at one interesting example uh, of what people have come up with. This is a Dutch designer's design. Uh, it is called electric vacuum cleaner. It's supposed to suck smog from the skies. Copper coils are buried beneath the surface to generate an interesting electrostatic field. This electrostatic field would then attract smog particles to the ground. Uh, Dr. Wang, yes. interesting an example, not yes. necessarily going to solve any problem, big <laughs> ones, but what do you think about the motivation of people and how much energy that would mean for the overall change of the policies and also China's energy structure? 
I think the motivation is very strong, and the general public has put already a lot of pressures on both local and central governments to address this issue, to change their things um, before it's getting too much worse. I think that is very clear, but I think the general public also has to realize they are also responsible for this. I think this is a missing part of the education, and their own use of power, their own uh, driving of the big diesel in car, uh, big gas gas cars around in China, and also their choice of everyday mobilities and uh, uh, their lifestyles choosing, that mm -hmm. all affect us. So I think this is something, we had a broken link, we had a very strong motivation from the general public to change the situation, but at the same time, they are also lacking of the solution. They didn't recognize there are solutions already in their own hands to change the situation, or they, maybe some of them are trying to deny it. Um, but I think this is something all right. we all have to face. Well, I guess we are the solutions, Dr. Wang. Yes. We want to thank you, Dr. Wang Tao from China and Dr. Jennifer Turner from the United States, as well as Professor Anna Laura Wing White from the UK. Thank, thank you, you so much thank you. for being with us. Thank you. We hope we'll find a solution. Oh, oh, oh. Got to find a solution to this pollution. Yeah. Got to find a solution to this pollution. Oh, got to find a solution to this pollution. All right, and we're talking about the voicelessness when we talk about the poor man, you know, because if this is a conversation that's going on in China, where China's five-year plan is to reduce coal to a minimum, and at the same time, China is exporting coal energy to the Caribbean, to the continent of Africa, what does that say about those who are in leadership positions on the continent of Africa, in the African diaspora, and here in Jamaica. What does that say? What kind of research have we done? This is an ongoing conversation in China. It, we are not, it don't, you don't have to talk in three syllable words. You don't, you, we don't need anybody from the university. We just have to listen to the conversation that's going on in China. And this is an ongoing discussion. This is a program that was carried last week, Sunday that you just heard in China. There's a discussion last week, Sunday, in China, just seven days ago. They are talking about finding a solution to the pollution, which is coal energy in China. We are talking about polluting first, creating all kinds of health implications in a, in a country where the health system is so burdened that it is really a crippled, old, decrepit, I mean, you name it. So we're talking about introducing coal energy on the scale that we're talking about. And listen, you can't really just pull the wool over people's eyes, you know, because this is something that is coming, something about, about to happen, and we're not stupid. But we must have a conversation. Civil society, which is you and me, civil society must have a voice. Lots of people who are not in government, who do not sit in the Senate, who do not sit in Parliament, are thinking people who have opinions, who have voices and whose voices must be heard. On an issue like this, you can't just take a decision, you know, in a boardroom, sign off and, and all of this, and then pretend or behave, behave as if we have no say, no opinion, no voice, it is this voicelessness which you're forced upon us or which you're trying to force upon us which is going to result in the kind of change that you do not want. And we can substitute the word change for revolution. To hold a person in oppression, you have to convince them first that they are supposed to be oppressed or that they want it, 
or that you remain oppressed and we will provide you with jobs. But for you to get this job, you have to be oppressed. You have to be enslaved. You will have no voice. This is in essence what the PNP administration is saying to us. And the puny, the puny voice from the puny response from the opposition is nothing but another smoke screen to fool those who can be fooled that they're opposing this. So we're going to have to do it ourselves. There is the kind of greed and this rush to development which is not in the best interest of the Jamaican people. We, we've seen this mistake being, ma- being made on the continent of Africa. These are the very kinds of same kinds of mistakes that they're making on, Af- in, on the continent of Africa. We must learn from what's happening in Africa. We must find a solution to this pollution. I'm going to try. I wanted your response on this, and we're already getting uh, responses on the social media. And uh, we want to go um, at a Johnny Jahi says pollution. This is a strategy used by major players in society to destroy our health, to bring in their doctors so they can make more dollars. But they're not even bringing in the doctors. That's the thing. And even when they do, the doctors are not being properly paid. At select a princess talking about wasted energy, more smog. Uh, China smog, uh, no more pollution, hashtag. Thank you very much for that. Um, Pointing out, as we heard in the report, 70% use of coal in China. Why not alternatives? No more pollution. At uh, Niam Health says, Jamaica doesn't have infrastructure for the plans. China in Jamaica, when the air gets bad, they, the MP, can gas up the plane and leave Jamaica. And she says, um, some wisdom pixie dust need to fall on all members of parliament so they can think of the people's health first before dollars, China and Jamaica. Just tweet me at the, with the hashtag China in Jamaica and let us get going on that. This is some serious, serious problems that we have uh, to face and we can't run away from them. We can't, if we ignore this, it will not go away. It will jump up to, jump up to bite us in the butts in a few years' time. That's what it's going to do. We must be able to leverage. And for those who are saying that this is, you know, um, xenophobia or anger being spewed at China, um, China is having the very same discussion about itself. There is no xenophobia here. We recognize uh, what's happening with the the uh, the expansion of China. We recognize what's happening on the continent of Africa. We see a lots, lots and lots and lots of positives happening on the continent of Africa, which we have been talking about, and we're going to continue to focus on. But we want to ensure that we do not make the mistakes that will just wipe out, make null and void the positives. We're going to be talking about more of that um, before the program is out. But in the meantime, let me take a few of your calls. 974-5079-5051-5043 and 1-888-991-4152. We'll take just a few calls. Um, your response to what we just heard coming out of that discussion. Hotep, Sister Andrea. Hotep, my brother. Um, you say... Peter Church, that song you have playing in the background. Yes. You got to find a solution to the pollution. Yes. I'm wondering if these politicians, if they ever give a listening ears to these songs and even some thoughts to we Jamaicans, yeah? That's With this China thing and the coal. Yes. I, and, and I think that it, we, we have passed the stage, the stage of wondering now and, and, and what are we going to do? Because there, we have to act, you know, uh, as, as I've been quoting all morning from John Henry Clark, um, the kind of oppressive state in which we find ourselves, uh, See, uh, which most Jamaicans find themselves. Um, it we, seems to me that this is it's because so many Jamaicans have been convinced that they are supposed to be in this oppressive state so that they do not have a voice. So we talk about do they care, do they care, but that's not the point. What are we going to do? 
I, some, about some are sitting down and saying, well, we are going to get jobs, 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 so right. go ahead with it, with this. But what about our health? Right. We have 250 to 500,000 persons already dead in China in recent memory, in recent times, from um, this kind of pollution. And this is See, this is coming from the, the other day. Yes. Just the other day I was watching um, on the BBC, which the, the pollution, it's way over normal. Of course, yes, it's on red. I'm telling you, this was last week, you know, the last, you, the last clip you heard, the last um, discussion um, said, and we missed that part because we were having difficulty with the player, but um, said that they, 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 for the first time, the level in terms of a pollution level had moved to red in, 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 in first time in recent memory. So it's yes. really, really bad. Yes. And, and this is being attributed to coal. So we don't need much more than to look to China to see what the end result of introducing coal to Jamaica is. Thank you very much, my brother. Oh, Hotep. So, hello. Hotep. Yeah, good morning. Yes, greetings. Hotep, yeah. yes. Um, I want to find out about the pollution in China, if it's true with them using the coal. Well, from what China, what, you know, we're not making any assumptions. We're listening to what they're saying in China about their own situation. And what I just heard from the, the program that, that, that was aired on CCTV last week, Sunday, is that they're attributing this to coal for the large part, okay. that this is a result coal. of coal. This is what they're so. saying about their own problem in China. So when them come to Jamaica with that um, development, you, you think the government will allow them to use coal? Well, this is what, this is what we're hearing, you know, that, that the, the, the suggestion from China is that they will use, uh, they'll be utilizing coal energy. That's what, that's what they've been no, saying. I mean, they, when they come with this Goat Island thing, you but, think... But it's not coal when, it's not when, this is, this is all, this is, it's not two separate things, you know. The, 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 the agreement that has been signed include what kind of energy will be used. This is not a... a so they, or, yeah. it's, it's coal them signed to in, in Jamaica. That's my understanding. Coal? Coal, yes, coal, yes. So why the government allow them to use coal? I what want you to ask them that. So that's your coal job. No, coal, no one old-fashioned thing, man. Why them they use? Um, so this is the first time you're hearing about it. <coughs> this is the first time you're hearing about it. No, I never know that it's coal they want to use. That, that's they're most going to use different what? things. Oh, solar. Mm-hmm. No, no, no. Okay. All right, so so wherever you, I want you to ask them that question. All right, please, because we we have to do that. That's part of what we have to do. But um, Why? before I go, before, yes, hello, yes, hello, before yes. I go, you see. Mm-hmm. Why do after people them don't form a party and um, turn the government and stop stay on the outside and criticize? Why don't you ask the rest of people them that? Okay, because then they'll sit on there and allow ballot people for uh, our own things. Yeah, I think you should, <laughs> just, as, I, as, I, as I have said yeah. to you about asking the government, yeah. go and ask the rest of people. Yeah, yeah, anyway, don't stay on, on the buy side and criticize. You know? Well, I don't know who you're talking to in this situation. Yeah, farmer party and... Um, yeah, but I don't know who you're talking to. My, bro- my, my brother, my brother. Mm. This is not a space for the uh, shenanigans that you're about to go on with. Yeah, Goodbye. Yeah. One of our problems here in Jamaica is that we, uh, in, in terms of how we interact with each other, it is so antagonistic that we do not, regardless of what we call ourselves, whether it's Rastafarians, whether it's Christians, regardless of what the labors we put on ourselves, that we've become so antagonistic to each other that we are all, somebody's always on one side and somebody's always, always on the other side. In this space, we're African-centered. As long as you're black, you're an African. All right, let's go back to the phone lines. Hotep? Hotep, sister. Hotep, my brother. Good yeah, morning. Yes, how are you? I'm all right. Yes. I listened to the, the piece you, you did. Yes. And I, I, from what I got out of the piece is that China is having a problem, yes, and it's from coal and the amount of cars they have on the street. Yes, um, the, 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 the first piece um, is an older program that was carried months ago, and I should have said that. And the second discussion is the latest discussion, because if you notice, and it is my, my fault, that the first discussion that was carried months ago was focusing on two issues. But by the time we got to last week's Sunday, which was just seven days ago, that you heard nothing much more about the, the cars and so on, but you heard the focus. But they, they, uh, they do have on, a big problem with cars. They do, uh, nobody's and, denying yeah. that, but I still i'm still and, context and, i'm still contextualizing yeah. the thing for you because i admitted to do that yes go ahead yeah, okay. yes go and ahead and the problem that california had both also the problem with cars also which they try right now in california you know, 
the cars are built pretty much different than they're built anywhere in the U.S. Yes, and the point you're but making. The, problem. Yeah. But the point is that um, China, Beijing is a huge city. And if, if they're going to be the kind of production that they're doing, they're going to need a lot of coal power plants, which is what they have. Jamaica. Yes. Is, is, I don't see Jamaica in a situation where you're going to have coal power plants all over Jamaica. Mm-hmm. All right. So you're not concerned about coal energy in Jamaica? No, no, I'm concerned, but I just, I'm mm-hmm. just trying to be re- realistic. Yeah, and, and pragmatic. Yeah. And so that what you've heard before from the discussions was not realistic, the discussion that's going on in China. You're saying it's not oh, realistic? Man, it's real, yeah, man. It's the, All right. I'm so you're saying it's me. not realistic to take, to, to, to extrapolate, to say that coal is a dirty energy and yeah, that man, dirty energy... Is, we know that. We know right, that. yes. And, and, and coal, there is clean coal being made down there. The U.S. is doing coal, mm-hmm. um, coal plants, which is clean coal. Right, and since we so have so not... This, so, this discuss, so this discussion can force... We don't know what kind of coal they're bringing here. We don't know if it's clean coal or dirty coal. <laughs> so this, this, what, this, do, this, what, what do you know? What do you, tell me what you know. Uh, what you know is this, mm-hmm. is that the coal, the coal that they're bringing here is not for the whole of Jamaica. Mm. That's, that's <laughs> what much we know. Right? Yes, yes. Uh, the, 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 the government or the governments are trying to go ahead and bring natural gas here, which is for the power plants in Jamaica. Mm. Yeah, is, 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 is a logistic hub for, the, for all of Jamaica? Yeah. Is it, is, is it for Jamaica at all? Yeah, man, yeah, man. Yeah. Really? It's not the whole logistic hub of the China. What do you know about the logistics hub? Uh, the logistics hub is divided into two sections. Mm-hmm. One part, the Goat Island, the China is the going to have. Mm-hmm. The other section is the government of Jamaica going to have, mm-hmm. which is which is Coal Bay and all of that. Yeah. Right? So there's two sections. Mm-hmm. So the other section bringing a coal plant is not going to yes. affect running the whole country. And and, and 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 I'm not quite even sure, I'm not even sure why you're talking about running the entire country because in China they're not even talking in China and I don't know why you got that impression from a, from the discussion you heard. Basically, the, the 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 main thrust of a discussion and that is why the woman who wrote the book dying dying for development was actually part of a panel because here we, the the main focus is health issues and you don't it, listen. You don't ha- you don't you just have to be you just have to be near where somebody's smoking you know. Uh, yeah, for the, for those, with, and, and no, no, hang on, no, hang on. So can I finish though? For yeah, for man. those who have allergies, I, when I come in here in the morning, there are a few things I do when I get to the studio, including moving something that just a small thing, but it it has carpet like um, you know properties. I have to do that because of my allergies. It not con- it not affecting all of area FM, but it's affecting me. So I have to every morning I come in, I just move it. Mm-hmm. So I'm just saying that there are people who will be affected in many different ways um, from from dirty energy. Mm-hmm. Right, and so that there's a cons- there's also that's consideration. The point you're making uh, is that you think that they're they're going to be taking in clean energy, and you're saying this because you got this information from where? No, that's not what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. I said that this conversation may force them to take in clean energy if we don't know what kind of energy. That's the, the idea. Energy. That's the idea. Yes. Is that yes. it will force course. them to change? Yeah. So if it forces them to change, so. Yeah. We, we're, we're saying, why are they bringing coal here? We don't mm. know. No, but if we don't have a conversation, how would they... You see, that's... You see, really? so, right, so you that. have to have the conversation. Yeah, yeah, Remember, so that's you, what I'm doing. Yeah, man, I'm, 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 I agree with that. I'm not quarreling. No, no, no. None of us is quarreling, but, but you're contradicting yourself. You're saying that we, we don't know, we don't know, but this conversation might force them to, to change. And I'm saying yeah. that's, the, that's, the, that's the, the aim and the objective of a conversation like this. Right. All right. All right. Thanks but, for calling. But, but, that, but I think I think we're going on it. In, it the conversation is more like we're saying we don't want them. Come, we don't want them to bring coal here. May I ask you a question? May I ask you a question? Yeah. Did you hear when I say that um, this is not xenophobia? That this is about mm-hmm. leveraging China Jamaica relations. That we we're watching China and Africa, and there are many positives happening with China and Africa. We're going to be talking about some of them later, but we don't want to make the mistakes that Africa is making. But we do need to leverage China relations. Where in that do you get that we don't want them to come? Where in that All did right. you get that? Right. Let me go further. Hang on, wait, wait, wait. Mm-hmm. If 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 and I and I just they divided what the, the logistic hub is. If we are going, you haven't answered the question, no, my brother. Well, I don't know. I don't know where in it. Yeah, because I mean, you I mean, can't. Because you, you, I know. I know that this is an ongoing discussion in Jamaica. You know, but you see, in this space, we have not gone there, and we have been having this conversation for for, for quite a while now, and we have I've never gone there. 
All right? So maybe your, your response is to something that you have heard in another space, but certainly not in this space. All right? All right. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, the number's out. <laughs> I apologize. 974-5079-5053 and 1-888-991-4152. Hotep? Good morning. Hotep, my sister. How are you this morning? I am doing very well. How are you? I am doing fabulous. I listened to you on the radio and I said, there goes my girl. Shut them up if they're not talking what you're talking about. No, 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 no. Issue with that also, which is quite true. There is an issue with car pollution all across the world. I mean, your goodness, go to Egypt and your, your, your Ghana. I mean, in major cities across the world, um, we do have that problem. So, yes, but that, um, and so you had a right to talk about that, you know, because we want all, you know, all the different perspectives. Uh, yes, to the space. yes, yes. I- I do understand that, but yes. you know, if if they're having problem in China with coal, mm-hmm. and they brought bring coal to Jamaica, we're gonna we're gonna have the same problem, I think. Yes, we have we have a problem now with them digging up the the, the whole other place and the pe- dusting the people out. But why do we have problem with that? that if, if we have a problem with that, we should ensure that that problem changes. That we change That's that we find a solution to that pollution. Yes. I, I think that, there are many ways to, to deal with, with, with stuff, I think. So, so if, if you dig up and you dust up, then there must be an easy way to wet up back and, and, and you know. You know, that's agents. exactly what I said, yes. but they, they don't do that because this is most time for the well, year. Let me ask you, though. You see, the thing that I'm thinking, though, my sister, is that, mm. well, you said it's the second time for the year in Jamaica, and maybe you're not here long enough to deal with some of these issues in terms of holding those persons who are responsible because they're agencies. Oh. They are agents. Yes, we must hold them responsible. That's my we argument. Must hold them accountable. With this yes. is my argument. We said everybody have to get together. You have to get together and hold the people. I was saying the same thing this morning, my sister. That's saying why we the are. same thing. And we that is not. why that is why I, I've been quoting John Henry Clark all morning that to hold a person in oppression, you have to convince them first that they are supposed to be oppressed. So anything that's happening to them is where that is supposed to be happening to them. As long as you know you get a little, um, what do you think the program name Jeep or Bullock yes. or whatever it is, you know, to hand out here and there. That's it, that's our situation. So that's the situation. We love the hand out, but and then when we get the hand out, we realize that the hand out is not good enough to do what have to be done. At some but point, but they're gone because we don't hold nobody responsible. At some, we, at some point, we have to find a solution. Oh, to all I have it. been trying. No, no, no you trying. can't. But you're, you're doing. You continue. Don't stop. Yes. Don't give up. I can't. Yeah, I can't. This yeah, is ma'am. my country. All right. Give thanks, my ma- give thanks, my sister. Give thanks, sister. God bless. Thanks for calling. And their challenges even in the Sino Jamaica relations, China Jamaica relations. Their challenges with China in Jamaica and their challenges for Jamaicans who are heading to China. Because this is a two way street, you know. There, as there is a, a China, a, an Africa in China, so too there is a Jamaica in China. It's a two way street, and we're going to be looking at it all. Hotep? Hotep? Hello? Hello? Yeah. Hotep, my sister, welcome. Thanks for calling. Morning. Yes, Hotep to you. Good morning, Andrea. Hotep, my sister. Hotep means peace. Peace be unto you. Go right ahead. How are you, Andrea? I am doing very well. How are you? I have one minute, just minute, so I'm going to throw me out there and move, because I have one minute, the credit finish. Yes. And every time they have them all kind of different problems, they bring come here in a Jamaica. And it's one thing I have to tell them this morning. His Majesty came here in 1956, and we heard what he has said. And in my hand right now, I have the Constitution of Ethiopia, and the Constitution of Jamaica right now in my hand. And I am going to start to talk things, because inside the Parliament, in the I want to clean up. The people is the government. They're not in the dictate and tell you what they're going to do. And just sing anything down our throat and think Rastafari is going to stand and take it. Rastafari will be the next government in Jamaica. And I know that straight. And it's going to happen in here. The flag of the down and the red, green and gold. Emblem is going to go up up there. It's the last year. Rastafari. Fire and quake in here. Oh, uh. 
Thank you for calling my sister. Uh, hi, just a minute. So we've lost her. All right. I want to take... Oops. Let me take a quick break. We'll come... All right. We're going to end the calls. If there's a call, let me take whatever call is holding and then I go to a quick break. Hotep? Hotep, Angela. Hotep, Hotep. Um, look here. Yes. Some, some, some time, I say. Yes. But I'm a keeper for sell you a motor this. Yes. Some of them call at it. No call for shed no light, you know. Mm-hmm. Them call for draw, you know, for this track, you know. It is right? not, it is when not, it's not possible. When a man come talk about yes. clean coal, clean yeah. coal, it, it make it sound like you have dirty coal and clean coal. Clean coal is a concept. Yes. Clean coal is a concept where it, all coal is dirty. That's right. So you try to clean it up by, by, by send the carbon dioxide go underground mm-hmm. I hope it not spill out back into the atmosphere and, and hope what, and hope being the operative word yeah, yes that is what clean yes. coal is yes so don't make them fool you know like say oh you have you have some clean coal where look There's, white and some dirty yeah. coal <laughs> don't get my spirit crossed yeah you know? well, well you see because you see Garnet you weren't fooled and, and I'm quite sure that 95% of the listenership um, wasn't fooled either no um, but you by, see some by, of them um, too, by that I just week yeah. before last they yeah. start to hear the term them and I run come like them know anything <laughs> my my question from early 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 you see Andrea yes. Yes. was if the Chinese do where them do where me and you know the how them pollute them own environment, yeah. are they going to come to our own and say, Oh, let's not dirty it up that's how we did ours? Yes. And then one other thing that we are careful to say and just and hold a question, but one other thing we're careful to say, instead of saying the Chinese, because what that does is to bring um individual, you know, ordinary persons living in Jamaica and been living here forever, Chinese living in Jamaica, into uh, into this fray. And that is where we so hear the conversation of xenophobia. Parent, so, so let us say China. China if China and that's why and that's why I say hashtag China in Jamaica. Yeah. We have to make that distinction of China in Jamaica. I prefer to say that. That, that, so we understand that we're not saying that all Chinese, no. uh, the station owned by Chinese, to you because know, that, you our, know, are pollution. No, you're right. right because yeah. our, our Chinese are we right? <laughs> yeah, so the, we are talking about the new brother them, the sign of China relationship, or right. the sign of global sign of, sign of, sign of Jamaica, sign of Jamaica relations, or sign of right. Really so, 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 so the question, so the question you asked is a very good question, and that is the question that we have to ask ourselves, even coming out of listening to the ongoing conversation in China itself. This is yes. not, this is, China is not shy, you know. This is a conversation that they're having in the global space. CCTV is a cable TV channel that yes. is seen all over Africa and the Caribbean and the rest of the world. So uh, this is a conversation they're having out in the public, out in the open. They yes. do not need anybody to defend them. They are trying to find a solution to the pollution. They know that they've got to find a solution to the pollution. Thank you, Garnet. Give thanks. Yeah, good morning. Yeah, hold up, my brother. Yeah, how are you doing? I am well, and you? Yeah, man, not bad enough. Yeah. Uh, listen, yeah. I, as, as Garnet just a while ago, mm-hmm. the distraction, we're not going to work with it. Because, Andrea, I heard on another program where this guy, I think he's representing some um, some institution in regards to as China and Jamaica. Yes. He came on another program and said that the reason why China opted to use coal is because the other energies are too expensive. Mm-hmm. And he's saying that even if they wanted to do the same green coal technology, as Garnet was explaining, mm-hmm. that would even be more expensive than even the LLG have been the same amount of um, thing there right. that, that's trying to run away from. Mm-hmm. So the point is, it's not whether they're going to use clean or, or dirty coal or not. Mm-hmm. They're using the cheaper energy, which would be the same thing that is of polluting their own country. Exactly. That is what I heard on the, the yes. station. Yes, and, and, and I, I think you're, you're exactly right, my brother. And that is one of the reasons why the, the conversation almost move away from us just discussing it to holding our le- persons in leadership position 
uh, responsible now and accountable to say that we will not stand for that. That exactly. you must uh, you must have a voice in all of this. Um, so you're going ahead with Goat Island, and there'll be many voices raised against that. Um, we st- I have I still haven't made a decision uh, in terms of what uh, understanding what's happening there. But so you're going ahead with that, and this is why from the uh, from early out we have been talking about how do you leverage leveraging is very important in our relationship with China. It, 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 it's not, there are no two questions about that. But we seem to be powerless in all the negotiations, in our need to, for, 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 for development and our greed at the same time. And so the question now is that, are we too now dying for development? Yes, and, and, and when you're going to say that it's not going to be, gonna be all over Jamaica, pollution is a thing that troubles. <laughs> no. I mean, it's here we're talking about, you know, it's here we're breathing. So it's yeah. not a matter if it's even at Negril Point or St. Moran Point. Yeah. Once it's anywhere within our facilities, yeah. it's going to affect all of us. Yes, I right? That's what is happening in China now. It's only concerned but you do understand, region, but, you, but, it, you, but you do understand that that point of view is important to talk through because yes. he's not the only person who thinks that way because yes. of the information that, you've, that they've been fed one way or the other. And that is why it's very important to hear that point of view to be able to address that point of view. Uh, before right. I go, just yes. one quick thing. Yes. Um, the thing is, another thing again, um, the whole idea is that they're not giving us everything in one spirit. It's just being given us to us bit by bit. Mm-hmm. Bit by bit with Goat Island now, bit by bit with the type of energy. Yes. And everything has been already conceived, um, as, as, as already signed, signed off. Signed as we have yes, yes, yeah. yes. Come on. Yes, and that is why we say that, we, you know, to reduce the China, to reduce China and Jamaica and Sino Jamaica relations uh, mm-hmm. to just Goat Island or to energy is wrong because this is a bigger picture. China doesn't operate in the way that we are discussing senior Jamaican relations. China operates on a, on a wider scale, especially not just even Jamaica. With it, think about Jamaica. Think about the Caribbean. Uh, sure. It's not just a Jamaican issue. It's a Caribbean issue. And, we can, and we can learn lessons from, from Africa. Thank you, my brother. Yeah, man. Take right. care. Learning some lessons from China and Africa. Quick break. We'll be right back. And that is why we go back to bearing witness. So we bear witness on behalf of Chief Taichi, on behalf of Chief Taki. We bear witness on behalf of Queen Nani. We bear witness on behalf of Paul Bogle. We bear witness on behalf of Baba Sam Sharp. We bear witness on behalf of all those who fought in the Emancipation Wars. We bear witness on behalf of Dutty Bookman Dutty. We bear witness on behalf of all those who fought in the wars, in the battles for freedom, for emancipation. Those who, whose names we know and those whose names we have not yet rediscovered. We bear witness on behalf of our own great-great-grandparents. We bear witness on behalf of Africa. Bearing witness is not to sit and watch. That is watching. Bearing witness is to be present in the moment to ensure that the liberation and the movement for liberation, the movement for freedom is not derailed, is not betrayed, even by those who look like us. Because in our particular case, the greatest betrayers wear our skin and sometimes infiltrate our movements for full liberation and full freedom. So we bear witness also being mindful in the moment, present, understanding what the mission is. That we must fulfill this mission in this generation or else become one of the betrayers. So we bear witness to the relationship between China and Jamaica 
the renewed relationship you know um thanks to uh, dr ona bradba in in writing about the people of woodside where my own great great grandparents are from in that general area rock spring woodside and so on uh, uh, pear tree grove etc in St. Mary, that she found my people. <laughs> and she called to say, Andrea, I found your people. And uh, your great, and that would be, yeah, that would be my great grandfather, was a person in this area who provided shelter who, for the Chinese during the Chinese, during the riots in Jamaica. That your grandfather was one of those who did that. Many of us, uh, you know, have similar history, I'm sure. If they were in the space, because you were living in this area with these very same people. And uh, they were your neighbors. And all of a sudden, there was a riot. So, so, so that we understand that this is a re-emergence of the relationship between China and Jamaica. We have no problem with that re-emergence. We're saying that we must be equal partners at the table. That we cannot allow ourselves to be as powerless as we have talked ourselves into being. Chen is predicting that China's leadership will remain stable. It will remain stable and be in full and in full control. Um, Xi Jinping's uh, era will era will go on for a while, and that China's focus will remain on ensuring domestic political stability and economic development. And he talked about structural changes to China, such as the aging uh, demography, the continued migration to cities the higher population growth rate as a result of loosening restrictions on the one-child policy, the higher labor costs, the dangerous levels of income equality, the lack of universal social system, and of course the worsening of environmental conditions in China, talking about weather situation and severe weather situation due to the climate change and so on, and domestic pressure for input on decision making by the ordinary Chinese people. So it's highlighted global competition also from other emerging nations um, that he's been looking at. But that, um, in looking at Africa, and we've been reading the literature on that, and, and also talking to Ambassador Shin himself and so many others about what's, and these are experts on China who have been focusing on China and Africa for a very, very long time, that China uh, is now in, what, 50? 50 of the African states? Uh, in terms of, uh, um, you know, serious business relationships. And, uh, and he's also looked at some of the concerns, some of the challenges, B- both to China and to Africa. He feels that, considered collectively, Africa will do better economically than most world regions. And that there will be a disproportionately high, this will be disproportionately high as compared to other regions. And he's predicating that on the discovery of new natural resources because Africa, he says, is the least explored of the inhabited planet. He'd point to oil and mineral prices uh, and, and, and the role that Africa will play in all of that. But Africa has to be able to leverage uh, relationships. Um, uh, whether or not Africa will experience any great um, reduction in the rates of poverty, uh, what would be the obstacles to that? Once again, it is this level of powerlessness that we're talking about, that if Africa itself, and we know there are many states in Africa, but if Africa itself collectively does not recognize its power as a collective, that's why Africa unity is important to, to black power. <laughs> so when we talk about black power, we also have to talk about unity. And this is a situation we see playing itself out on the continent of Africa, where there's the Africa Union, but Africa unity itself is still fleeting. Some of the challenges um, Africa is facing now. We're looking at the, 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 the current agricultural output, for example, um, urbanization, population growth, and... Uh, Relative to the rest of the world, we're looking at climate change in terms of North Africa and also looking at the relationships, equitable or not. 
with all of the major trade and investment partners, including China. Africa is now operating as if it's better to have an antagonistic relationship, competitive relationship between China and the U.S. in Africa because they think they will benefit. Um, David Shin is, is arguing that while this might be true to a point, that where where China and, and and the U.S. agree on the continent of Africa, there could be more gains. It, does this hold um, true for for Jamaica, for the Caribbean, for the Caribbean waters? That's another question because we're looking at the Caribbean Basin Security Initiative, which we hope to do this morning. At the same time, we're looking at the logistics hub on Goat Island. Uh, we're looking at China in the South uh, China Ch- Seas, in the uh, East Indian, in the Indian Ocean, and we're looking at um, the 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 militar the militarization of uh, the continent of Africa and the waters surrounding the continent of Africa. So that the relationship between the U.S. and China is one is a competitive one, and in some cases. Uh, especially even when it comes to the military. Let me go and find my notes on that because it's interesting, you know, uh, when you... Ambassador Shin argues, uh, China currently has about 1,500 non-combat peacekeepers assigned to six UN missions in Africa. And he says that this will continue. China will continue to participate in peacekeeping and security operations. And he's predicting that they'll do so only if they're under the United Nations. Um, African organizations are done independently of Western-led organizations. So there you see immediately the competition. Now, um, while China will resist putting PLA troops and police personnel on the ground in anything other than the most benign circumstances. Ambassador Shin, who's an expert on these uh, affairs, says pressure from African countries, he feels, will result in China sending combat troops to one or more future peacekeeping operations in Africa. That is going to change the face of everything in Africa because uh, of AFRICOM, which we have talked about many times in this, in this space. China is a major supplier to African countries of military equipment, especially small arms and light weapons. We need to know that. May I just say that again? China is a major supplier to African countries of military equipment, especially small arms and light weapons. China and Africa, we're saying that we can learn from China's relationship, Sino-Africa relations, Sino-Caribbean relations. What can we learn? What questions must we be asking? China's percentage of total transfers, especially more sophisticated conventional weapons and military aircraft, seems poised to increase in the coming years on the continent of Africa. At the same time, there's growing complaints about the existence of China's small arms, Chinese small arms and light weapons in African conflict zones. That's some of the issues Africa is dealing with right now. And Ambassador Shin says he feels that this will result in a greater effort by China to monitor the ultimate destination of its weapons transfers and to crack down when the weapons end up in the hands of unauthorized persons. The military and security relationship between Africa and China has been the most undeveloped part of China's interaction with African countries. So right now, AFRICOM is sitting more or less, I mean, while, because you could see, you know, right after the, the Chinese premier visit to, to, to the continent of Africa, that um, the, U, the European Union, you know, swooped in and uh, in the footsteps of China. So AFRICOM and America is worried about China-Africa relations. That is the truth. One of the things that's going on on the continent, though, is that as Chinese interests in Africa experience increasing threats, there's an estimated one to two million Chinese nationals or persons of Chinese origin living in Africa. And these nationals increasingly find themselves in harm's way. We have that conversation going on in Jamaica right now. Maybe not so many numbers. So what Ambassador Shin is saying is that the Chinese have experienced kidnappings in the Niger Delta, kidnappings and killings in Sudan and in parts of Ethiopia, and 
36,000, as you recall, had to be evacuated from Libya in, 20, in 2011. So he says increasing Chinese investment in Africa, the establishment of more companies and a long-term presence will result, he thinks, in a growing number of attacks on Chinese. Not because they're Chinese or singled out by terrorists, but because they're there and, and the threat exists, he says, to foreigners. But he says... And this is how he's reading it, and I agree with him, that host country security will not always protect them. And increasingly, China will use its own resources for this purpose. China will use its own army for this purpose. China will also reduce the degree of security risk that it is willing to accept in Africa. China... Is also will also reduce the de- degree of security risk that it's willing to accept in the Caribbean, in Jamaica, downtown Kingston. Uh, we have had conversations with him already uh, in this forum, and we're going to be uh, talking to him about some of these predictions that he's making about Sino African relations because we think they uh, are relevant to us here, here in Jamaica. He says that China has been developing its naval capacity, especially its long range submarine fleet, and recently its first aircraft carrier, so that it has capability beyond the South China Seas. So far, China's naval activity in the western Indian Ocean and along the eastern Africa coast has consisted of occasional port visits and engagements since 2009 in the Somali anti-piracy, that, that Somalia's anti-piracy operation in the Gulf of Aden. China, he says, will step up its naval visits to the western Indian Ocean in an effort to demonstrate greater ability to keep open the sea lanes that convey so much of its commerce on Chinese commercial vessels in both directions. Why is that relevant to us? It's relevant to us because of Goat Island. There's an ongoing debate in China whether it should eschew its traditional policy of not having overseas military bases or establishing military alliances. Is that debate relevant to us here in Jamaica? Yes. Military bases, any discussion on any military base in China is relevant to us here in Jamaica. So, we have lots to talk about. We have lots to learn. Because it's the important thing in all of these discussions on China and China's relations uh, in the Caribbean is that we need to arm ourselves with the information, with knowledge, so that we can have an unemotional conversation about how we can leverage. It's, I, I'm, this is where I'm stopping. I'm not going beyond that. I'm not saying that China should not be in Jamaica and China shouldn't come here and, and there should be any, any, any investment and so on. I'm just saying that there is need to leverage and we must look again at the extent to which we appear to be powerless. As you recall, in a few last year, early last year, I interviewed an expert on China relations, uh, Dr. Yoon Park, uh, Yoon Young Park. And she had said to, to me then when I asked her about this powerlessness and how do we leverage the relations between China and Jamaica. And her thing was that where, where China wants to invest and where they have made overtures to do so, that we the administrations must not just stand by and say, well, you know, this is going to benefit us and going to benefit the people and going to perform, provide jobs and so on, without stopping first to say, to ask the relevant questions about labor, labor to talk, talk about labor laws, to talk about environmental concerns, to talk about migration issues. Because a lot of African governments held back on that because they wanted the immediate money. That's a mistake they made. Now the question, you know, just last week in South Africa on the South African Broadcasting Corporation, they were asking, are they too late in terms of the immigration issues? Are they now trying to close the gate once the horse um, had already bolted? (laughs) <laughs> so we don't want to be having those conversations. Yet we hear about visa restrictions being lifted and so on. News is coming up in a few minutes. As I said before, we're going to be having a conversation with Ambassador Shin shortly about his challenges and predictions 
uh, that he there's a speech he delivered in 2013 uh, about you know what what is looking at the challenges for, for Africa, the challenges for China, uh, and and predicting and he has done this successfully uh, many other times, which means that we can quote him as a source. By the way, Ambassador Shin is uh, adjunct professor at the Elliott School of International Affairs, George Washington University, former ambassador to Ethiopia and almost all of Eastern <laughs> of Eastern. Africa. So as we go through the year, and this is going to take some time, we will continue our conversations uh, on China. I educate myself. That's what I'm doing on this whole thing. And I really hope that in that process of learning, that it is a collective uh, learning process for all of us together. So we're doing this. We're doing this. We're continuing next week. Hopefully by then we'll have the ambassador. Not sure, but um, keeping our fingers crossed on that. Want to talk about the Caribbean Basin Security Initiative, if we have time? Wasn't the world going more solar in terms of... Alternative, away alternative, from dirty, yeah, from dirty from, energy. Yes, I, I, yeah. that, that, that was the first thing that came to my mind. And, and even China. Um, China's five-year plan is mm-hmm. to reduce, you know, dependence on coal energy. You know, so, so when, when I heard it, I said, what, you know? And um, we have seen a lot of cooperation in Jamaica going that route. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have the sun, we have the wind, mm-hmm. we have everything where that is concerned. So I was, w- w- was a bit of a surprise and taken back. But um, if it's a case where pollution is going to be an issue, you can't, you, can't have coal, yeah, listen, you can't have coal energy without pollution. Mm-hmm. I don't know, you know, how you're, how you're going to argue that. It is what it is. It's simple to, you know, mm-hmm. and that's why I said, you know, you know, you know three syllable words mm-hmm. to, to say that, you know, a dirty energy. Yeah. Um, coal is a king of dirty energy. Yeah. Uh, so, you don't need, no, you don't need nobody from, I, I, you don't need I, nobody from the University of the West Indies or UTEC to tell us. Mm, that, I, I was surprised you know. and I, I am hoping that maybe we can get some further assurance and explanation as to how this thing going to work um, oh boy. In, in Jamaica. Oh um, boy. Will, 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 will they manufacture it down <laughs> and, and maybe on one of the keys? <laughs> which, which keys? It, oh, you um, mean, no, you yeah, know, no, man, you know it, where we are at, Take Arcapel it out of the region Arcapel. altogether, man. Mm, take mm. it into the South China Seas, man. Yes, they are. And, you know, um, take it out of the Caribbean altogether. Chi- chi- China, China is also planning to build a canal through Guatemala, so um, yeah. we, we, we don't know if they are going to carry it. Uh, and you see, and that's, that's interesting as yeah. we talk about the canal, right? yeah. because, you know, one of the things that I was talking about earlier this morning and pointing to Ambassador David Shin's um, work, and we're going to have mm. him hopefully next week, is, is China's, there's, a part, there's an aspect to element of China's engagement with Africa and with the Caribbean that we're not looking at and we mm. haven't spent a lot of time looking at, and mm. that is a military element. Mm-hmm. And at some point, you know, what might happen? Mm. And I'm just saying that, you know, um, it, while we're having the conversations, mm-hmm. we're at the negotiating table, that we're supposed to be asking questions about this. Yeah, we'll That's one of the questions I must be asking. Yeah, we'll you know? have to because, I mean, we, we never ask, ask questions 400, 500 years ago and we just... Yet here we are. Here we are and then, I mean, is it a case where... We're having a, a, a more modern approach to this thing. Modern? Or maybe, <laughs> or m- maybe you know, and um, the, the, is this a part now of, well, we know that China is a very powerful country and we know they have their financial might and so on. Is this their way now of but the question is, what is coming power? into the scramble? Yeah, it, of course, yes, yeah. but but at the same time, you know, I, and I, it's not such a bad thing, you know, that yeah. that that you have because you, yeah, well, we're already in a globalized environment, mm-hmm. so you must have these kinds of interactions, mm-hmm. and and China is expanding. Uh, my thing is, is 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 not to push China away, but to say. How we leverage this? Yeah, how we leverage this? Yeah. How, how, um, we how can we work together? How yeah. can we work together as two recognizable sovereign states? Sovereign states, you know, so that yeah. we don't give away everything yes. and sell one another. Because what is happening now, as far as what I see happening with this administration, mm. is that they are selling us one by one, two by two, ten by ten, mm. um, back in slavery. Mm. Because you have not I even look at a simple thing like 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 coal, you have not brought to the table the issue of the health health concerns mm-hmm. of your citizens, mm-hmm. and if you haven't done that, then mm-hmm. you have failed. It means that you, it's just it's, it's go down and become 
a slave ship. Yeah, where does the Minister of Health come into this thing now? Because, you know, he's on a massive campaign on the overall... And smoking. Uh, and smoking. And, but I and there's no massive campaign in regards to the um, pollution from the, the many... The many um, motor machines that, that that we see on the road and um, and the burning and and then this snow. What kind of motor machine are you talking? Well, when I talk like oh, a little, oh, a little, see, <laughs> you know, oh, a little, oh, a little transport. Talk you yourself, know, talk mean, yourself, but, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, but I mean, why well, you see it, some some yes. sometimes you out on the road, you know, you know and <laughs> why some 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 stuff we 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 in here on the road, mm, mm. it worse. That a little God just woke and a little as you talk about the has to do with narcotics, has to mm. do with ganja mm. and the trade of ganja within the Caribbean waters. Mm. One pillar, 248 million US dollars mm. in, in four years or mm. less mm -hmm. um, from the US to the Caribbean mm. to stop that. And so uh, no government minister is going to get up and say, oh, I'm going to decriminalize it and it's mm. going to happen. Yeah. America is going to say no to that and they're going to say a very, very strong no. And that is why in, at the CARICOM um, heads of meeting today, mm. that's happening this week. Yeah? Sure, goodly Prime Minister. Is but that is mm. why this thing is on. The, uh, it has to be there. You know? It has mm. to be discussed because the mm. CBSI was signed off by mm. all of them. And I want to have it somewhere here. Mm. And I think I, I don't know if Joy printed it, but I need to. I need to to, to read that. Mm. The, and I think part of the happening? discussion today, Andrew, not to cut you, is that the, the whole Canadian trade impact because of we are hearing of. Canada's interest in right. our green goal right. and I mean, who mm. wants, how, how, that, how is that going to work bear in mind of that um, that agreement we the, have the, 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 the treaties yeah. the treaties that have been yeah. signed um, mm. the CARICOM meeting that is on the, mm. the, the uh, on the ganja thing mm. all right right so here's a report um, dry handing me to me mm. so researchers um, mm -hmm. Which is of the Caribbean trade bloc have found that decriminalizing marijuana and exploring its use for medicinal purposes could help boost the region's sluggish economy. CARICOM leaders are expected to talk about the preliminary report in a two-day summit that begins Monday in the eastern Caribbean island of St. Vincent. The report was released on Friday to the Associated Press. And uh, let me see. Mm -hmm. Experts of the Caribbean already has a built-in competitive advantage with marijuana cultivation, noting that Jamaican researchers have launched a company that produces therapeutic and cosmetic products derived from the plants. Many in the Caribbean still consider it a dangerous drug, and it seems as if they're stepping up. The police is stepping up its, its, its raids against marijuana. And you know what I, I noticed? Imagine. Have you noticed how many bags of cured marijuana have been confiscated? I tell you. Where are they? Those bags that have been confiscated. Did we see them burn them? No, we didn't see at all. Where are they? Well, Canada? And if they burn them, it will be some pollution concern. Mm, but, but who have them? <laughs> Question. Who have, who, where are the bags? The many, many bags of marijuana that was being found, mm. and cured and, you know. Yeah, that's a very good they? question, you know, because, I mean, we, every day in the news we hear of this and we hear of that and at the wharf, this and at the wharf, that and so on. And where it go? I mean, they, they, they should be accountable to the Jamaican people and say, what they do with it? Is it? being stored somewhere for well, when... Well, as, as an investigative journalist, I'm going to put you on the case. <laughs> <laughs> Please do trace those bags of... So, all the marijuana, mm, especially the cured, packaged one, would have mm, ready for export, mm -hmm, confiscated within the last mm -hmm, three months, mm -hmm, up to now and beyond. Mm -hmm. You need to know where they are. It's a very good question. Mm. Uh, it's a very, very good question that, uh, yeah, it, it, I mean, the more, the more it, it's stuck, we realize where it comes from. Where yeah, is it so going? You're, so you're going to follow the ganja? I always follow it, you know. I mean, but <laughs> sometimes when the new questions pop up, yeah. when the new questions pop up, it, it yeah. gives you a whole new perspective. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is one I, I, you know, this thing that hit me like, you know, all these package ready for export and are they in Canada or what? Mm -hmm. All right. So, CARICOM spokesman Leonard Robertson says leaders would examine the report next week, but noted it, it is not a key issue on the agenda. Uh, the, Amer the the Caribbean Basin Security Initiative will have to be will have to be revisited and revised for ganja to be decriminalized in Jamaica. And then that, that that's gonna take a little time. Take a lot of time. I mean, it's, it's, time. I mean, say it's two hundred and forty odd million dollars pumped into this thing. Mm, so I mean, yeah. very. It would be very interesting to know. I mean, um, Mr. Low and his um, plans. I mean, Mr. Paul. Well, if you say, mm -hmm. and then if you remember, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know if you. Oh, how, how long they can wait? 
leader. You see, this is a very interesting thing because if you remember mm. when Hillary Clinton went to the Congress to mm. beg for the money to back the Caribbean Basin Security Initiative, that was one of his selling points to stop the trade mm. of illicit drugs, including marijuana, mm. in the region. Mm. Yeah. So that's how she got that money. So it's not a U.S. thing. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's how they're stopping it, as you say, in the region. I mean, I mean. Yeah, but so, so we yeah, are part like of them. Yeah, because remember, mm-hmm. you had at the time you had Hugo Chavez mm-hmm. in Venezuela, mm-hmm. and so the, and you talk about Guatemala. Remember, you just mm-hmm. talked about yes. Guatemala and the yeah. and the and the Chinese, mm-hmm. the China Canal, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, think about it. Yes. That the 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 the, the competition mm-hmm. is in all the waters. Mm-hmm. So you have the Caribbean waters. Uh, you have the, the, the Atlantic Ocean, you have the South China Seas, you have um, the Black Sea, because yeah. this big hoopla now with Russia and, and mm-hmm. Crimea. Yes. And it's all about the Black Sea, uh, you know, it's about that port. It, yeah. kind of thing, you know? It's all about that trading port. Mm-hmm. So, wow. And, <laughs> as, and, and as, the, as we continue to, to, I mean, do what we are doing down here with this marijuana issue, states in the United States are busily. Um, Legislation, legislating of course, of course. for the decriminalizing yeah. and yeah. The, the legal trade. Yes. The legal trade in their own space. It makes sense. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense to me. No matter sense you. Well think about it. Yeah. Mm, it makes sense, man. Mm-hmm. All right, it goes and then it goes again to the powerlessness and we say uh, you know, Caricom have a step up to the table. Um somebody have to have a good talk with the Dominican Republic because of what it's doing in the region. Mm. how it's behaving there's just so much but mr concrete asphalt no new poems <laughs> today me don't know you have any yeah man always well go ahead you serious yes <clears throat> i'm sure big has never seen you perform <laughs> maybe you should have stand up <laughs> all right this one named liberate our minds right, right right Let's liberate our minds, our minds, our minds. Let's liberate our minds in this time. Interesting times we are living in. The world becomes one as each day passes. Communication networks creates a global village. Technology advancing the way how we live. Better get ahead than lagging behind in the van of no progress at all. Uniting we stand, separating we crawl. Marcus Garvey, the father of black nationalism, teaches the relevance of organizing. Rastafari, Earth's great ruler, exceptional qualities of a world leader. Ballhead Christian, Muslim Rasta, band together we secure with future. The growth of a people is complex and interrelated. Man must be united, educated. The only way we as a people will be truly liberated. Living, loving, no hatred. From the least to the greatest amongst us. Accept God's work as a must. Articulate without a fuss as reward for a job well done, not Praise alone, our money, our fun, rather, it's their inner satisfaction for a day's work well done. Let's liberate our minds, our minds, our minds, let's liberate our minds in this time. Let's liberate our minds, our minds, our minds in this time. <laughs> so I never have the B side. <laughs> now I have a dub. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Are you, are you pretending as if you didn't have a poem? Eh? No, I, always, I, I realize I almost I always have to be on the edge where you guys got to. Not a poem, man. <laughs> thank you very much. So, yes, I begin. Can I go on? Uh, all right, thank you very much, Selector Princess. Uh, retweeting uh, to CBSI, uh, hashtag CBSI, and how it impacts uh, decriminalization of ganja in Jamaica. Don Archer says, um, we have some very slow journalists. Minister of Energy said ganja will be decriminalized and most of them just swallow. And uh, that China will colonize Jamaica pretty soon. Watch and see because as it stands, anything China wants, China gets. Sign.
Liam Hill says everything is relevant for Jamaica, an island, not a continent. Weapons, military base, health, visa, and so on. China and Jamaica. And at Nediman says... All right, uh, clean energy, clean mind, pure heart. At Glocks MC, Wayne Gentle says, Blessing sister, we as Black Nation continue to look outside, not knowing what our true issues are, uh, that our true issues are internal, we have to fix. And um, at Nediman says, Big problem here in NC, is that North Carolina, with at Duke Energy, mind pollution, mashing up the solution. Clean energy, hashtag, clean energy, hashtag. Uh, this is not a non-JA, says uh, IRFM. Clean coal plus bagasse plus solar um, freshener plus uh, rank and heat energy slash nitro turbo dynamo is your answer. And quite a few posts from this is not a non-JA. Um, saying also, all right, yeah, ranking heat energy, nitro turbo dynamo equals sugar and JPS. All right, China and Jamaica, hashtag. At uh, SSMWINC says, that's bad vibes, says, hold up, sister. U.S. is having a big problem now with the waste ash that comes from the coal plants. All right. At Aldis Honkong, who is in the Netherlands. Good morning, Aldis. She says, no coal in Jamaica. If ever there was a place fit for sun energy and wind energy, it is Jamaica. And at Young Labour Rights says... We the people need to be more aware and until we take to the streets in peaceful protest, there will be no change. All right, uh, quite a few tweets coming in. We're trying to get to all of them. I also want to go to the to your Facebook posts. We'll try and do that shortly. All right, before we do that though, we have to go to the phone lines quickly. We're going to be speaking with Isis Miller about woman woman vision and we're also going to be talking to Denisha Prendergast about the Occupy Pinnacle movement that has been on the way for close to 40 days now if not more I think more alright so let's do this and come right back Cetamol Menstrual gets rid of bloating back pain and menstrual cramps so you can get back to the happier you the time by Sesamo Menstrual is... Now, 21 minutes after 9 o'clock, we're standing by to speak with Donisha Prendergast and Isis Miller. Coming up right after this. All right, so uh, good morning, Hotep, my sister. Greetings, my sister, Karuma. <laughs> hey, Isis. Oh, my gosh. Isis, I didn't know. I, didn't, I wasn't quite sure who was on the line. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Isis. <laughs> yeah, man. We love the energy with the Karuma art. We love yeah. it. It's so powerful. Yeah, the Ma'at Karu. You yeah, okay, the other way around. Ma'at Karu. I'm <laughs> <Yes>. so sorry. <laughs> It is fine. Thank you, my sister Vidasi. All right, so Woman Mission is on again uh, this year. It is an yeah. annual event. That how long has it been running now? Five years now. Okay, that's Mahat, quite five a years. Yes, we started um, at a place on Hopewood called Star Apples, where Empress and Stanley had a boutique there Mm -hmm. and Empress Stanley and Catisse Brissett who you know also we all came together and decided we wanted to start this thing Woman Ambition yes uh, which is not only an event an annual event for International Women's uh, Month Mm -hmm. but also uh, we incorporate a mentorship program by individual work that we do as well so even though the event happens annually separate and apart from that we do work you know throughout the year leading up to the event Right. So, yeah. the, so, so the idea behind this is what? Why, why woman vision? Well, um, Katice Brissett came up with this concept of woman vision, coined the word woman vision. And, you know, in our work, you know, Katice through the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, which does mentorship there, and Empress through her work, uh, Talk Up Youth, and Stanley, who is in 
California does work as well. We, we realize and recognize that, um, you know, we need to do some mentorship for our youngsters, um, even with um, the mustard seed home. Mm -hmm. for pregnant teens um i've seen some serious serious situations there were young people young girls who have been raped who have been involved in incest so based on this type of information we all came together and decided that boy you know we've had these experiences all of us Mm -hmm. in our work and we really want to bring awareness the event was to bring awareness to it okay you know even though we're doing it otherwise but the awareness came with the event and incorporating um you know, different artists who would come through and mm-hmm. perform. We, we mm-hmm. didn't charge to come into the event. We still don't, but we ask for donations towards uh, the home and other uh, projects that we do as well. All right. And so this yeah. year, when, when is this going to happen? And, and what well, it's year? taking place on Friday, uh, which is the 14th. It's taking place at Nanook. Um, it's 20 Burlington Avenue off Eastwood Park Road. Yes. And um, this year we have... Uh, persons like Etan. Etan has performed a couple times mm-hmm. uh, on the event and always looks forward to it. Yes. Uh, we have Empress Aitila Fear, one of you, you guys' favorite. We've yes, been that's performing true. That everywhere. is true. Yes, yes. That is quite <laughs> uh, Mama true. Cafe, you're familiar mm-hmm. with her. She's from the Ivory Coast. Right. And, you know, big drummer and chanter. Right. Marla Brown, who is Dennis Brown's daughter, will be performing as well. You know, she's okay. based in England. Yes. And the great Sherry Natural, of course, got of to course. be there. Of she's course. a revolutionary speaker. Yes. And she's been there for almost all of our events. You know, she's mm-hmm. a staple. And we have DJ Marshmallow, because we're trying to have, you know, mostly females. We have a youngster called Manifa Goss and Xylophone. Mm-hmm. And, um... The great Kashima Francis will be our poetess for the evening. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> yes. I will right. for, I'll come yes. for you, Pia Andrea. I'm coming for you. But I mean, that's quite, all, that's quite all right, my darling. Very yes. quite all right. As a matter of fact, you have done so much work with IRFM. As a matter of fact, a uh, person might recall that you were there just just a few Sundays ago at the Peter Tosh event. And oh, you're there awesome. every year on the stage. Thank you very much for your help as usual. Really, really you appreciate that. You are so that. welcome. It's and, an and, honor and to you, be there. And your support. So that. Yes. So that you just say the word and 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 we will say no. <laughs> yes, man. Yes, man. You know, they should not hear me. But anyway, so mm-hmm. um, <laughs> so Isis, uh, so this one is going to be on Friday. Woman, next woman, which is on Friday. Yeah. And, uh, I want to I want to make a point also that yes. it's not just an entertainment event; it's an edutainment event, right? Okay, because right. we're also going to have, as I said before, Cherry Natural is a revolutionary speaker. She will be right. speaking, also performing her poems. Yes. But um, we have what we call messengers. Mm-hmm. We're going to have a um, Sister Marie from Mandeville, who's a social worker, who she's doing some serious work with the young ladies from Annandale. You know, they were that, that big fire that happened in Annandale a couple Annandale a couple uh, years ago. Yes, Annandale. Um, so Armandale. she'll be yeah, she'll be talking talking about that and she'll also bring some of the young ladies who uh, so there'll be, the, so there be reasoning, there'll be reasonings and, yes. and, and discussions and, exactly. and also performances discussions and so on. And performances yes. in between good. as well. Yeah. yeah, so that's a good mix of, yes. you know, yes. just just enlightening people as to what's happening and how they can be a part. Because Woman Mission is not just myself, Empress, Stanley and Katiz. We're inviting mm-hmm. all our sisters to come forth and bring their suggestions and help us to carry forward the work that we have to do in our communities. All right, remind us of the, of the venue again. It's called Nanook. And it's at 20 Burlington Avenue, which is off Eastwood Park Road. It's going to be this Friday. It starts at 7 p.m. All right. Thank you very much, Isis. Thank Hopefully you. Hopefully we'll see you there. Yeah, man. Take care. And before I go, though, once again, I must say condolences to you all with regards to the loss of Chad. It's a great loss. And we just continue to celebrate his life. Thank you, my sister. You're welcome. All right. Uh, Denise, Isis Miller there. Woman Mission is on this Friday. All right. We're going to be speaking with uh, Donisha Prendergast right after this. Western Union moving money for better. The time by Western Union is... All right, going to go to the phone lines now where Donisha Prendergast is standing by. Just a quick update on the Occupy Pinnacle movement and also uh, a quick look at what happened at the, or if it happened, the meeting that was scheduled for last Tuesday. My sister Donisha uh, Hotep. Hey, greetings, Andrea. Greetings, greetings. Greetings to you, to my sister. Uh, all right, so just a, a quick um, background, Danisha, to the Occupy Pinnacle movement for persons who are hearing this for the first time in a minute or so. Give us an idea of what is the Occupy Pinnacle movement. The Occupy Pinnacle movement was birthed in an effort to raise awareness about the situation facing Pinnacle, where our heritage lands are being owned and desecrated by private developers with the knowledge of the Jamaican government. Um, who is now moving forward in a way to resolve the situation. 
Pinnacle, of course, being the uh, uh, the epicenter of uh, the Rastafari movement uh, here in Jamaica, the movement uh, ongoing for how many days now? Uh, have you been and uh, the group been occupying Pinnacle? Today makes 38 days since we've been physically occupying the space and we're covering lots of relics and history. Lots of people are coming, all the people are making their way up to Pinnacle to share bits and pieces of the story with us. So, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 38 days of that experience. Mm-hmm. And, and the aim of this Occupy movement, 38 days now at Pinnacle, is what? The aim of the Occupy movement is to research and document the relics of heritage that are on the property and also to identify additional heritage spaces which may not have been identified in previous investigations, as well as to pro- pro- provide a platform for the Rastafari community to reclaim our heritage from the Jamaican government and private investors. Uh, and, and the hope in terms of the, of the, the, the construction, the building that is happening on the land, the, that the land is being claimed and being built on, being developed, what is the hope regarding that? Well, not the hope. What is the reality regarding that? Um, in the meeting last Tuesday, it was brought up again that there is still construction happening on the grave site, which is supposed to be Mrs. Howell's grave site, as well as other other um, lots. Now, it was mentioned by the representatives of the commission that they would put forward a team, again, put forward a team to do the research. The National Heritage Trust did indeed come to Pinnacle to look at the said um, lot. However, they realized very quickly that they didn't come with the proper research tools, so they will have to come back again and also issue uh, what they call a preservation notice, which will almost create a buffer zone so no construction can happen within this zone while investigations are happening. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, this, is, this is taking quite a while in terms of, of you know, stopping the construction. Uh, it might seem short to, to, to some persons, but construction is what it is. The, so, so the meeting on Tuesday, tell us about that. Who was there, who, who were represented, and, and a bit of what happened? Mm-hmm. Well, represented at the meeting was the commission at the Prime Minister put together, um, led by Mr. Bertrell Whiteman. Mr. Rupert Lewis was also there. Judy Wedderburn should have been there, but she was absent. Lisa Grant of the National Heritage Trust was there, as well as a representative from the National Land Agency. And from the Rastafari community, we had representatives from the Leonard Howell Foundation, Occupy Pinnacle, the Rastafari Youth Initiative Council, and representatives from the Millennium Council as well. And, so, yes, go ahead. All right, so let me just move quickly through through what happened. The government put forward that they are prepared to declare and acquire six lots, the same six lots which were previously identified in 2009, with the intention to further investigate other sites of heritage for similar consideration. However, Mr. Whiteman made it clear that at this point, the commission did not have the authority to say yes or no, whether the if we identified other heritage lots, whether the government would be willing and able to acquire that. That is something that he would have to come back. But the, but the, what, but the government is now saying that it is prepared to acquire six lots. Six lots, yes. Which is a move, a, a positive move yeah. um, in the context of knowing that at the, at the start of the year it was one lot and, mm-hmm. it, and an eviction notice. Mm-hmm. However, we also do observe that in previous discussions from 2009, these six lots were already earmarked. Mm-hmm. in addition to 120 acres to mm-hmm. be considered for acquisition on behalf of the community as well. This point was brought up again from Mr. Whiteman, mm-hmm. who did take the notes to say he was going to put it forward to the Prime Minister. So the Rastafari community is waiting in expectation mm-hmm. that a positive um, outcome will come from this discussion on 120 lots mm-hmm. to be acquired for the community. So, so there's a process on the way now for the acquisition of those six lots? Well, if, if, if from what Mr. Bertel Whiteman is saying, then yes, we can confidently say that the process is on the way to acquire these six lots. Um, he, we looked at a time span of four weeks to have the next follow-up meeting. Mm-hmm. And we also put the note in that February... We never made a lot of noise in February. We did all of the things that they wanted us to do. We laughed, mm-hmm. we sang, you know, mm-hmm. we danced, we take pictures, we never make no noise. So we're hoping that the Jamaican government will see this as an instance of grace mm-hmm. and put some speed 
as to this resolution with the clinical situation. Mr. Virtual Whiteman told me that they are short on um short on help. Mm -hmm. Um within what kind within of help? The, <laughs> I guess they're they're short on people to work for them. You know, oh, so I offered to help to find in some assistance. So we're going to be working together to put together an additional team um, to, to assist the government in moving things a little bit faster. All right. So are you are you upbeat, optimistic about what you're hearing so far? Yeah, man, I'm very upbeat. I'm very optimistic. And I'm even more optimistic about the 120 acres that they're going to come back to us and say, yes, we are going to work together to move this forward. You know, mm -hmm. so I, I see this as a step in, in the right direction. The National Heritage Trust, like I said, did come to Pinnacle to the youth and culture. So in okay. order for a uh, cease and desist order to be put into place, it has mm -hmm. to be signed by the Ministry of Youth and Culture, as well as we're going to be involved in the Ministry of Health and the Spanish Town Parish Council mm -hmm. to help us to facilitate a cease and desist immediately. Because if it is that they're building on grave sites, as we are saying, yeah. then this is also a health issue. And it needs attention. All right, we're going to follow this. And that is that is a challenge, I think, um, to get the Ministry of uh, Youth and Culture to sign that cease and desist order because of a conflict of interest. So we come right back to the conflict of interest. Uh, we, can't, we can't leave it alone. We're trying no. to leave it alone. But, you know, it, it stands because it's reality. It is there. It is the elephant in the room. It has to be dealt with. Either we do something to the elephant or we feed the elephant. One or the other two. All and, right. you know, one, one other thing quickly before we go, one point about this meeting that I think was excellent yes. was the fact that this was the first meeting that the Howellites actually sat in with the government. Okay, brilliant. And I got a chance to interview them. I spent about 10 minutes interviewing them, just asking them, you know, what was life like yes. at Pinnacle? What are some of the things that you guys used to do? And, you know, and I quote, we had farms, football fields, animals, and no fruit trees about the place. We as youth then were the ones who planted, not for the trees. So I sap, sweet sap, cashew, mm. mango, nisberry, orange, you name it. Mr. Howell never run wire fence because everything was for everybody. And I'm asked a question and say, one question, I don't know nowhere in Jamaica where you can bury or lease land to bury people on. It is against the law. So his, basically his statement was this. If it is that Mr. Howell did lease the land or rent the land, how is it that we were able to bury our people when that was against the law? All right, so we've got some questions there, are some serious questions on the table. Danisha, um, the struggle continues, the lucha continue, and we see progress. I hear that you're optimistic on this, and we will keep in touch with you on this. And once again, we encourage uh, members of the Jamaican community, of a Pan-African community, of any part of the community in Jamaica who consider the issue of land an important issue in Jamaica, please make your way to Pinnacle, give some support to the group there who are occupying this land because they understand the seriousness of this issue. Thank you very much, my sister. Yes, Andrea, one more thing before you leave. I'm sorry. We had a court case on Thursday mm -hmm. where we were petitioning for the eviction notice to be overturned. Yes. And I, I boy, you know, the, the, the judge asked, so how exactly is Rastafari indigenous? I mean, I'm a bald head. Does that make me indigenous too? I don't really understand. That's the judge who said that? No, when you have when you have people in these kind of legal systems who are going to be making a mockery of us like that, it mm -hmm. calls, calls for a, a different kind of reaction. You so we're asking people to be gracious. You and also know. you also need to ask there needs to be the lawyer need to ask that the judge recuse himself from the case and, and get another judge into place because that is prejudice. And we acknowledge the prejudice. Yeah, I just wanted prejudice. to make that note. It's prejudicial. I mean, he need to remove himself. Yes, All right. Thanks. Yes, my sister. All right, Andrea. Mm -hmm. Yes. One single day, 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 you remember it's been at the last school thing, but we know so that no right. All right. Um, we're going to go to the bottom line shortly, but I quickly wanted to talk about Walter Rodney and the Commission of Inquiry. Uh, that is. That is ongoing. No, in um, in uh, Guyana. As a matter of fact, we understand that there are some issues surrounding that. It's ongoing, but uh, the presidential advisor on governance uh, there, Miss Gail, uh, is it Texura? 
Well, she has said that she finds it unfathomable that the Guyana Human Rights Association has refused to bring whatever documents, evidence and opinions it has to the Commission of Inquiry that was set up into the death of brilliant Guyanese historian politician Dr. Walter Rodney. She says... Uh, that the Ghana Human Rights Commission had said that it is unwilling to give evidence in the inquiry, noting that at a time of much speculation over general and regional elections, the proposed commission could not be read as the worst form, could be read as the worst form of electro- uh, electioneering. So that's interesting. Unfolding there in Guyana, uh, tit for tat, and uh, Gail saying that, Miss Gail, we're going to use her first name, saying that she is totally shocked. She said she was around at the time. And this thing is, to her, a shocking bit of uh, response coming from a Human Rights Commission. But the Commission of Inquiry into the murder, the assassination of uh, Walter Rodney is underway in Guyana. Hey, uh, we didn't get a chance to talk much about the new Monsanto, the Dow Chemical and their new Agent uh, Agent Orange crops. Uh, we understand that Dow Chemical has now made a new, uh, what is it, pesticide that is now taking the place of Roundup. Because as you know, Roundup is now in many cases ineffective. Uh, the weeds have grown resistant to Roundup. And Dow Chemicals, we understand, have now made another uh, chemical which they hope to get approval for this month, which is called 2,4-D, and it is far more toxic than Roundup. The Huffington Post is reporting that uh, the chemical is being linked to non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, lowered sperm counts, liver disease, and Parkinson's disease. And that studies have also demonstrated the, chemical, uh, the chemical's adverse effects on hormonal, reproductive, neurological, and immune systems. Hmm. We're going to talk some more about this next week. Also going to be talking some more about the Sharone Migrant Detention Center, where the lawyers say the facilities do not comply with approved blueprints. And, you know, Israel's racism is in full view of the entire world, Sharone B and Sharone A, which is a prison um, that Africans are being placed in if they dare cross over into Israel. We'll talk about that next week. That as we celebrate International Women's Day, it was yesterday actually, let's not forget that every 90 seconds a woman is raped in the DRC and a progress on what's happening in the DRC also means an end to sexual violence. In the bottom line this morning, we're talking about when and where we enter. The bottom line is that, as Anna Julia Cooper so aptly put it, only the black woman can say when and where I enter in the quiet, undisputed dignity of my womanhood without violence and without suing or special patronage. Then and there, the whole race enters with me. The bottom line is that Cooper's confident declaration as far back as 1886 holds a profound meaning for every black African woman today in 2014. Even as we celebrate International Women's Day, we did that yesterday. The theme for International Women's Day this year was equality for women is progress for all. This on the surface of it underscores the idea that women, and in this space, black African women's liberation, black women's access, embraces the admission of an entire race, of all of us. The bottom line is that Cooper was clear in her reasoning that while black men bore the stigma of race, African women bore the stigma of race and gender. The matter of when and where we enter, therefore, is an engendered, enabling moment. The bottom line is that it is in this knowledge, this understanding, that the black woman, the African woman, becomes aware of her role, her mission, her purpose as generative and an enabling 
moment. The bottom line then for us as black African women, when and where we enter, is not just about equality. Because we're asking questions about our own particular situation as compared to other races, such as European races. That while European women talk about equality, they're talking about equality with European men. When black African women in our own particular situation talk about equality, what are we talking about? Are we talking about equality with European women? Because the situation that our men find themselves in also deserve attention. And so that our focus on equality as black African women might be distracting us from the greater purpose of community. So that when and where we enter is not just about equality, but more so about community, about our voices in liberation movements, about whether we sat or we sit and wait on others to define for us our own reality, who we are, and how we are supposed to act, what the theme should be as we celebrate International Women's Day. Do we talk about equality or do we talk about community? Do we talk about the boardroom or do we talk about community? We must build communities as black African women because when and where we enter, the entire race enters with us. So when and where we enter is about whether our agenda is an agenda of community access, of liberation, of full freedom, of partnerships with our black brothers, or merely of equality. There are too many of us who are not yet in communities for us to be focusing the extent to which we focus on equality. The bottom line is that as black African women, we must be acutely aware that our agenda for liberation is different from any other race. And we make cruel and dangerous mistakes when we hitch our wagons to those of others. We must redefine the agendas for change. The agendas for change that we want with our communities is partnership. Our liberation, our access to the full promise of freedom, embracing the admission of the entire race. The matter of when and where is critical to the development of our communities. The matter of when and where is an enabling moment taking an entire race, male, female, children, with us. The matter of when and where is a, gener- is a, uh, a, a generative, transformative moment. The matter of when and where is an extravagant, expansive moment. The bottom line is that only the black woman can say when and where I enter, understanding that entry, however enfeebled by barriers to full membership, parallels earlier entries into historical consciousness. And that when and where of both moments are engendered, are enabling, are generative, are transformative, are extravagant, as I said, are expansive and is community. The bottom line is that as Devasti, a soldier who fought in the Haitian Revolution under Dessaline said, we now for the first time fought for our true interests. And we're no longer the mere instruments of our own destruction for a cause which was foreign to us. So as we reflect on International Women's Day and uh, parody the narrative or parrot the narrative of the Caucasian woman for equality, we must think about community. We must think about where our black men are. Yes, I am going there. Because our communities are in shambles. Our men, if it's equality we want with the majority of of African men, then we're going backward. 
because when and where we enter as black African women should enable us to reach back, to reach forward, to reach beside us, to pull our black African men with us because they too have been emasculated. So it's not about the boardroom for the entire race. For us, it is about community. For us, it is about partnership. Only the black woman can say when and where I enter in the quiet, undisputed dignity of my womanhood without violence and without suing or special patronage. Then and there, the whole race, the entire race enters with me. That is the power of the black woman. That is the bottom line. <laughs> Thanks also to uh, the, those of you who are on the internet at iwfm.net. You've been listening all morning and making the contact, tweeting and making your, your uh, posts on Facebook and on other uh, social media. Thank you very much for that. Really appreciate the the company that you kept with me this morning. My name is Kabu Ma'at Keru. Kabu Ma'at Keru. You know me as Andrea Williams. And uh, we're going to be talking about the name sometime very, very soon once uh, all has been finalized. So we'll tell you. You'll hear everything. You'll hear every, every, everything. Every little thing <laughs> about the Ma'at Keru. All right. So we're going to be coming back hopefully, inshallah, God's willing, the dear Valente. Next week, Sunday, we're here Tuesday evening for Sex Wise, and then again, next week, Sunday. My producer is Joy Morgan. Thanks to our telephone operator, Simone Brown-Keys. And